Has it really been 100 episodes of Set Point? Indeed it has. What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taryn Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. Like I said, this is episode 100 of Set Point. Yes, 100. The big one, zero, zero. As we have not one, not two, not three, but four guests on today. One is a volleyball coach. Two are passionate Kentucky fans, and one is a play-by-play announcer for Stanford Sports. We're going to be getting into them in a little bit. Also, I'll be telling y'all the story about how Set Point originated and how it became to be. So, set up the net, hand me a volleyball, because I'm about to serve you some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you the 100th episode of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point, episode 100. I hope you all are having a great Monday afternoon. I know I am. And honestly, it feels surreal that we are at 100 episodes. But I'm not here to talk about that. Let's get on into the volleyball actions, shall we? So my first guest is the head coach of Huntington Beach Boys and Girls Volleyball. He's a six-time CIF Southern Section champion coach as he coached three at Modern Day on the girls' side and three with the boys at Huntington Beach. And he also is a four-time CIF SoCal Regional champion, having recently won in 2021 of the spring. Ladies and gentlemen, coming back for a second time here on Set Point is none other than the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Craig Pizzanti. Craig, how you doing, buddy? Doing good, Craig. And I'm glad you're here. And thank you, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I really appreciate it. So let's do this thing. So let's do it. Mm hmm. And just like the last time you were on here, the thunder has been sounded. So we get, let's get this party started. But first, before we get into the action, just a big disclaimer these are the thoughts and opinions of myself, Taryn Rodriguez, and Craig Pizzanti, and not the thoughts and opinions of Huntington Beach High School. University of Baylor, Long Beach State, or IE Sports Radio, or any third-party organization. So, all right, now that we got that out of the way, Craig, your team, your boys' volleyball team had a big season last year, or last spring, as they just won the CIF SoCal Regional Championship. It was an up-and-down season overall. If you could describe it in one word, what word would you describe this past spring? Um... Yeah, I, I guess roller coaster, kind of just like you said. You know, if that's if that's if I can c- combine that into one word, <laughs> um, you know, we had some, uh, we definitely had ups and downs. You know, and um, you know, I think the the biggest thing, and I obviously with everybody in our in our country, or especially in, in the state of California, was just the the stress of are we going to have a season? You know, and you know, actually just getting out on the court, even though the season was modified and there were no tournaments and no travel and modified preseason stuff just getting getting the kids out on the court i thought was just a huge uh accomplishment i thought it was um it was well deserved after losing you know the spring of 2020 you know a t- couple couple weeks into the season so you know just super happy that our athletic department and the state got these guys back on the floor and so anything that happens 
um, either positive or negative, just being out there, I think, was a big win for everybody this year. You know, obviously, the season ended great. Not very many people get to end, their, end the season on the win, the, you know, their last match. So that was great, too, you know. But then, you know, we had some ups and downs on, you know, were we going to even be in the playoffs? Were we going to get into the Division One, Division Two, whatever it was? So um, just being on the floor was was a, a huge accomplishment. And obviously, getting to go down and win um, – that final game was was great as well. So I guess that would that's how I would, I would describe it. Yes, absolutely, and it was a phenomenal season for you all. The season started off great for you all, as believe it or not, I want to say all of your regular season wins were via sweep. Like, were you a little surprised that that happened, or explain to us how your team was able to sweep all these opponents? Well, yeah, I mean, in the preseason. You know, usually, and I know you know this, I mean, it's it's just the culture of volleyball is, I mean, we nobody really ducks anybody. We try to play in in high-level competition against high-level competition. So because of, you know, the, the modified schedule, you know, we didn't get a chance to do that. So I feel like maybe early in the year we might not have been playing as high-level opponents as we're used to early in the year. So winning in three is, is you know, I, while, you know, a win is a win to me, I mean, I wasn't – expecting anything different i guess and i don't know that it really prepared us our preseason for what we were about to get into you know playing newport twice playing cdm twice playing survive at the end of the, you know at the end of the regular season um and i feel like we kind of were a little bit behind going into um the surf the surf league and the sun you know within the sunset conference so um you know the fact that we were winning easy you know i i don't i don't necessarily think it was an indication of that we were playing great um, I just don't think we were challenged as much early. Um, and then, like I said, I think it, it came back to bite us a little bit as we got in the league. I think by we got by the time we got to the second round of the league, I thought we were playing a little bit better and obviously, you know, kind of showed towards the end when we were, you know, going through the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had a few tough losses. But you know, in some of those losses, you played really competitive. I saw your game against CDM the second go-around. Like, what could have you tweaked in that match to have gotten the win um well you know we were going through some stuff just like everybody was you know having having guys playing multiple sports and just beat up and whatever but i you know i think that we kind of finally found the right recipe as we were going into the playoffs you know even though um you know the first time i, I would say the only time we really got run out of the gym was when we played at newport in that first the, first, the league opener um you know like i said i don't think we were prepared um you know, that could be on me a little bit. That could be on the schedule a little bit. I think we weren't ready for the speed that they were going to play at. Um, but, you know, other than that, you know, both both losses to CDM were in four at their place and at home. And I thought we, we were ahead late in uh, in set four at home against CDM uh, the second time around. Um, and then the loss against Servite um, late in the year, you know, the last regular season game before the playoffs started, you know, we were it was senior night. We were playing some guys and we were arresting some guys um, for the playoffs. So, you know, like I said, I kind of throw, that, to me, it's kind of a throwaway. Um, mm. But, yeah, I, I just I, – I don't know that there was a, a moment when something clicked or whatever it was, but I just feel like, you know, we just kind of never kind of hit our groove until the playoffs started. And then we got into this, you know, continuous string of five-step matches. I mean, we were having a hard time even getting on the practice floor just because we were tired and, you know, fatigued. And we were on the road, it felt like every night, you know, in the playoffs, both in the CIF playoffs and then we I think we had one state home game. Um so I think that took a lot out of us, too, having to drive to Santa Barbara twice, having to drive down to San Diego. I mean, those are atypical situations when you're playing in a CIF final and a, and a regional final where you're usually playing, you know, a neutral site. So, um, yeah, I just think it was a long, kind of grueling year, you know, on their bodies, on them mentally. Um, but, you know, like I said, I was glad. I'm really super proud of the guys for finishing it the right way. Yes, and some before we get into the playoffs something that else was unique about this season was you actually got to see your son play this season on the JV level what it, did you what was that moment like for you all or what for uh, you yeah that was i don't want to get all too emotional it's, you know he's just a freshman but oh okay. you know i went to i went to Huntington and i played on this in this gym and i mean he's been coming to he's been coming to games here since he was born in an infant carrier and just you know, the time seeing him on the floor for the first time was pretty cool. Um, he got to move up for the playoffs, and he was, you know, he got to actually play in a varsity match in the, in the playoffs in the first round of CIF. So, you know, I've coached him at the club level, but, you know, when you get out here and you're playing for your school and community and stuff like that, especially, you know, my alma mater, and, you know, he's been wanting to go to school here and play volleyball here for 
for since he could, since he started playing volleyball. So it was pretty. It was a pretty cool thing for both me and my wife to just to see him out there. But you know, and all all my friends who went here and played volleyball with me when we were here, you know, it's, it was a pretty cool thing. Mm-hmm. And that was very unique to see. So now we jump to the CIF playoffs. As you know, as you pretty much said, you were on the road for most of the postseason, and. What was that like just being on the road multiple times? And do you think you accumulated, like, driver's miles and that you could possibly get sponsored by, like, Capital One? Uh, yeah, I tried to I tried to do a math on it. and I, I mean, we were I think we were on the road. We were in a bus or a van for uh, over a 12-day period for over 24 hours with the, with the two trips back and forth to Santa Barbara. You know, the trip down to San Diego, the trip to down, you know, it was, we were, we were in, in vans and buses a long way. And I, um, to, to be honest with you, like, I almost feel like that was kind of a bonding moment for these guys, you know, because, you know, no one had really been in a bus at that point, right? We were all kind of going on our own to the games because of the COVID scare and everything. So, um, I think that was kind of really helpful for us, actually, even though, you know, the ride home from Santa Barbara the first time. I'll tell you what. I will tell you this about the road, the, being on the bus and being in the vans. The ride home from Santa Barbara after a win is a lot better than the ride home from Santa Barbara in a bus after a loss. I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I just think that they built on that experience. You know, I the first time was on a Saturday when we played them in the CIF finals, and um, we had a couple. We had a van, and then but a lot of parents just drove their own kids up there, and you know the timing wise and how to get up there and. It, it was just, you know, you never know what traffic's going to be like in Santa Barbara. So on a Saturday, of course, there was a ton of traffic. I think it took us over three hours to get there and closer to four to get home, you know. And so uh, the second time, we kind of prepared a little bit better for it and went up there a little bit earlier than we thought we should have and, you know, had lunch up there and near the school. So, I, I, like I said, I just think that the whole process was unique this year. And, I, you know, as much as you would want to complain about, you know, having to play a CIA final on the road in Santa Barbara, it's like, the fact that they were playing at all and that we were in that match, there's nothing to complain about. Just the fact that we were getting to play again and trying to get back to some sort of normalcy. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was good stuff. We actually have a question here in the chat room. This comes from iSports Radio colleague Adam Karnick. He says, what's the hardest part about coaching your son? Uh, well, um, I, obviously at the high school it's a little bit different than um, you know coaching in youth sports. I mean, I've coached him with his club group and – you know, Little League Baseball and AYSO Soccer and, you know, whatever sport he was playing at the time, flag football. Um, and, you know, you, you tend to see the the two different types of coaches that are parents, right? You have the the ones that are too hard on their kid and the ones that are too easy on their kid. And you try to find the balance and be somewhere in the middle and just treat them just like everybody else. But I, I feel that, you know, we, if he's going to be on the floor playing for me, it has to be – super obvious that he deserves to be out there, not just to me and the coaching staff, which is all that really matters, but to everybody else. I don't ever want him to get labeled as the kid that's playing because his dad's the coach. And I've never treated him like that. I've, you know, I've always pushed him maybe even harder than I should sometimes. And I always got to take, take a step back. But I think the hardest part is not having to talk about it 24 seven. Cause I was actually just talking with, with him and my wife the other day, we were talking about something with volleyball and, you know, when all the other kids leave the gym and they go home, they're away from it. But when he leaves the gym and we're in the car, it's, you're still sitting there with your coach. So I try to really, you know, differentiate, you know, from the time at home versus the time in the gym. And I, th- I think he does a really good job of that, too. Just, you know, when we're at home, it's dad. But when we're in the gym, it's coach. And he's, you know, he, I don't think he's ever called me dad in the gym, you know. And so that's, you know, that's kind of a uh, try to just wear the two separate hats and try to separate it. But I, obviously that's going to be the hardest part always. Awesome stuff. So let's jump to the SoCal Regional Playoffs, or as everyone calls it, the State Playoffs. So obviously you won your home game in the first round, and then you got to see Santa Barbara a second time, and then you eventually got to see a team from San Diego, Torrey Pines. Like, against Santa Barbara, how were you able to defeat them, and what adjustments did you make as opposed to the first go-around? Well, you know, I mean, I guess the one good part about um, the whole COVID thing is that a lot of people were broadcasting their matches, so it was a lot easier to get scouting done. And it, that may have been actually to, to our um, detriment a little bit in the CIF finals because, you know, I had a couple different videos of them. And, I, and um, you know, they, they uh, Chad did a good job. They made some changes um, to the lineup than, from what I saw when we, you know, when we were preparing for them. 
And by the time we adjusted, we were down, you know, 2-0, tried to make some adjustments on the fly. We were down 2-0. And then, you know, came back and just out of steam and we lost in five. So I think just seeing them and seeing them live, I mean, they're two outside hitters, did a really good job. They were, you know, big and physical. And being able to see it once and being able to just come back and try to make the make the changes in our own gym now that we could see it live. You know, you know, all of us, you know, most of the most of the top teams are at Best of the West or that's the Orange County Championships or the Redondo Championships. So you can see people and, you know, the stuff on video isn't quite the same as seeing somebody live. So I just think playing them once and being able to try to make some adjustments that we've seen now obviously was, you know, was um, helpful to go back there the second time. Also the travel, you know, being able to prepare for the travel the second time. So anytime, you know, do something once and, and, you know, you make some errors, make some mistakes, but if we don't learn from it, you know, we, we like to say we're either winning or we're learning. Mm-hmm. And uh, if we didn't win the first time, but we learned from it, we won the second time. You know, that was, that was, that was great. Once again, in tribute, both, both teams were pretty evenly matched. If we played 10 times, we might go, we might go five sets, you know, nine of those times. So we both had different strengths and different weaknesses, but I think we we're both pretty evenly matched. Yes. I re- I actually remember that quote uh, in the uh, Santa Barbara article of that game and i'm like yep that sounds like something craig would say now yeah. your championship match in the socal regional came against tory pines a team from san diego which ha- was vastly improved like what did you need to do in order to defeat tory pines and what was that feeling like when you got that championship point um well you know I, I, actually the fifth set was the the least close set out of all of them so i i, I was feeling pretty confident i think we were up uh, you know, 14 to 8 on championship points, or, 14, you know, 14 to 8, 14 to 9, something like that. Um, so the fifth set, it, it was more like to get to that point. Um, but, you know, it, it was it was very unique because while the, while the players were much different, I mean, the the prep was pretty similar as far as, you know, being left side dominant, um, just like Santa Barbara was. So even though they weren't big, you know, two guys that are 6'5", you know, jumping out of the gym, but they were, they were still left side dominant, and... Um, so it made the transition from getting ready for Santa Barbara on the Thursday to getting ready for Torrey Pines on the Saturday a little bit easier from a, from a preparation, especially, you know, we're in Santa Barbara on a Thursday, go five, get home at, you know, close to 11 o'clock at night, dead legs. We didn't really, I mean, I, I don't, actually, I don't even know if we practiced that day. I can't remember. I think if we did, we just came in and served and passed and, and talked and got out of there because, you know, fresh legs, I feel is more important than an hour of extra reps. But, um, so it, it did help the fact that I think both teams were pretty similar offensively in what they were trying to do. So they did a great job. I mean, once again, we were ahead to, we were ahead to one, had a chance to win it. Um, they came back and got that four set. So, um, you know, I, uh, from the time we played Servite in the semifinals of CIF, we, you know, we went back to back to back to back to back five set matches. And actually that's a lot of volleyball for these guys over a, over a 12, 13, 14 day period. Mm-hmm. And then you also got to tack on the uh, Servite one. So all in all, you played five straight five set matches. So that's a grand total of 25 sets, if my math is correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know you're a science teacher, so... <laughs> 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 all right. So I know Huntington Beach is well-known for talented volleyball players such as TJ DeFalco, Josh Tuaniga, Shane Holdaway, the list goes on and on. Like, did any of those players in the past, like, talk to your current team bef- the day before the championship game? Well, um, no, and, and I mean, obviously, the, uh, TJ and, and Josh was still in competition to be, to, you know, make that, make that Olympic team, too, so... They had their hands full, and, and they were pretty busy, I think, during that time. I would hope that at some point, if we get to that situation, again, I would love to have those guys come in and, and do that. But uh, they were they were pretty busy with their own uh, with their own stuff going on. Shane, Shane's still playing at Long Beach State, and those other two guys playing for Team USA. So um, they, they, we talk about it all the time. I mean, the banners are up in the gym. They see and they know, you know. So, um, you know, yeah, we definitely have a very rich volleyball tradition, and you know, being able to see one of our one of our own, you know, play, you know, this morning and for Team USA is a pretty cool thing. So, um, yeah, they, they didn't come talk to them, but hopefully at some point we'll, they'll be able to do that. And that's actually a perfect segue into our next little topic. So, TJ DeFalco, one of your former players, made the national team, the U.S. Olympic team, and then Josh Tuaniga. I told you he was on the team, but he actually was an alternate, so that was my bad. But still, that's still a great honor. So, 
what it, when you first found out, what was your reaction to that, and how excited were you for both Josh and TJ? Well, and let's not forget about Brendan Sander either. He was, oh, yeah. you know, he, was <laughs> he was in competition with those guys as well. And um, you know, like I said, I've been super fortunate to coach some pretty elite athletes. It's amazing how much better I get when I have great athletes. So, um, but you know, it was it was awesome. I mean, I, I I never had a doubt that those guys would be competing at that level. Um, you know, I mean, TJ was during his senior year of high school, he would leave our practices or miss practices sometimes to go train with Team USA when he was 18 years old. So uh, it was it was just a matter of when. I don't think yes with those guys, but it still doesn't. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't really prepare you for how cool the feeling is to see that when they're walking out there and they're you know they're wearing Team USA stuff, and you know that you know. Well, it might be just a small portion or a small piece of his volleyball life. I was at least there for you know for that. Mm-hmm. And then, ob- then obviously TJ put on pretty much a good show in his first match against France for Team USA. Like when you got to see TJ on the television, what just went through your mind, and what memories did he bring back for you all, or for you? Uh, well, I mean, he's, I mean. He's- doing the same stuff he did at, at our level. I mean, he's been, you know, he's been one of the best guys, if not the best guy at every level he's played at. So I, I would expect him to continue to do that at, at this level as well. He's just, you know, the bigger, and the, the thing that I always said about TJ was the bigger the match, the better I knew he was going to play. And, you know, just watching him, watching him back there from the service line or hitting the big or, and which I, I mean, his, he hits the big like crazy. It's, Brought me back to that last CIF final match when he, you know, he had 41 kills in the CIF finals, and everyone in the gym knows where the ball's going. It's like it doesn't really matter. You can know, but you're not going to stop it. And, you know, when he gets hot, I feel like he'll be able to do that at, 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 at any level. Great stuff, and I even remember some of those TJ DeFalco moments as well, as my team in high school was Newport Harbor. Uh, it was much painful moment, memories. <laughs> well, they've, got, they've gotten back at us a little bit since then, so it goes in cycles, Darren. So you'll, you've, been, you've been on the winning side lately. <laughs> yeah, I can't argue with that, Craig. So anyway, for you, Craig, I will just say this. What's it, for those of our new, new, new listeners out there, what's it like being a boys and a girls volleyball coach, and how difficult can it be? Well, it was obviously a lot more difficult this year when everybody was trying to play at the same time. And, you know, not only am I trying to manage the high school boys and girls programs, but the uh, coaching a club, boys and girls club program as well. And everybody trying to play at the same time and managing bodies and stuff like that. Um, but it's definitely a different beast. I mean, coaching the guys and coaching the girls, I mean, it's, it's volleyball by name and similar by name only. But I mean, the, I think the way the game is played is different. Um, you know, I was just talking about this the other day. We're going through club tryouts right now, and it's, you know, just trying to figure out what people are thinking and how to – I try to treat them, the guys and the girls, the same, but it's just you got to treat them a little bit differently and just understand the the feeling side and all that sort of stuff, depending on who you're, who you're coaching. And um, But, I, you know, I, I, I think they're – at the end of the day, they're, they're athletes, you know, and we're trying to make sure that they – become better volleyball players but more importantly when both those guys leave our programs you know we want them to be better people too and, and understand you know that sports is just a small part of life and ho- hopefully we can learn and be better people because of it so um you know that's that's my goal at the end of the day is to i mean obviously uh, you, if you've seen me coach taryn you know i'm pretty intense and i'm pretty competitive and i want to win but you know bottom line is you know at, at, when it's over it's over and then we're back on and we can you know we can move on from there so you know, like I said, it's a little bit different, but at the same time, they're still high school kids and they're high school athletes, and you want them just to have a successful, positive experience. Mm-hmm. And that, my friends, is Craig Pizzanti and how he's become a well-known name when it comes to Orange County Volleyball. So, Craig, I know you are very busy. Thank you very much. We're actually going to go to a quick commercial break. When we come back, we will have our second guests on the show. So you're listening to the 100th episode of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Hey guys, it's Blake Henley, better known as H-Town Blake to some of you. Happy to announce that Faces Load is back in full force. 
We bring in that high heat every Tuesday night here on IE Sports Radio. So come home, get ready, dig into that batter's box, and see if you can chase that high heat, baby. So we'll be coming to you live with all the stats, all the rundowns, all the division rivalries, and every team that's going to make the playoff push to get to that one and only October and get to the pinnacle of what baseball is to hoist that commissioner's trophy when it's all said and done. It's your boy, Marcus Los Great. Here to give you what you want. Here to give you what you need. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to you live. Straight from your mama's basement with a crispy white right tea. <laughs> They are coming to you live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. sports fans do you like wine well we've got the show for you this is let's wine about sports a show where we talk about wine and sports simultaneously from the classic cabernet sauvignon all the way down to the grapes that you've never even heard of before oh yeah we cover it all and we'll talk about a little bit of sports as well football hockey collegiate women's sports it doesn't matter we're going to talk about it all and we're going to whine about it all so join me Monday at 8 p.m. on IU Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome back to Set Point. You can check out all of our amazing other shows here on many platforms such as Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Podcast Addict, Deezer, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, you name it. So there's that for our show. So definitely tune in to all of our amazing shows because we are all a bunch of podcasters who love what we do. So now, first and foremost, we'd like to thank Craig Pizzanti for being a guest here. He was very busy, and the fact that he took 25 minutes out of his day is absolutely amazing. So now let us welcome our next two guests. Yes, I said next two guests, because we have two guests waiting and willing to talk with me. So these two of my next guests are the hosts of a podcast called Cats Talk Wednesdays, which goes on every Wednesday on Anchor, and it's a part of our neighbor station, BS3 Radio. And these two cats are diehard Kentucky fans, as these two love to talk Kentucky, and they were both ecstatic about Kentucky's women's volleyball team winning the national champion. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome here on the 100th episode of set point is Mr. Vinny Hardy and Terry T.B. Brown. How are you two doing today? 
Man, we are good, man. A great intro, TV boy. Oh, that, that that got me hype up. That was Shade with Ed McMahon getting hyped up for for Johnny Carson back in the day. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling the energy, feeling the love. Thanks for having us. Hey, no Absolutely, problem. Man. Hey, no problem. I appreciate you taking time. And fun fact about Vinny, Terry, and myself, I was actually on their show, Set Point, or not Set Point, uh, Cats Talk Wednesdays, the week after Kentucky's women's volleyball team won the national championship, which was quite something. So it was a great experience, and... No doubt about it. Thing, man, I wanted to find somebody from outside of Kentucky that talked volleyball. I said, we've kind of uh, got a feel for it and learned about it from everybody from within Kentucky. So let me see, you get an outside of perspective. I don't even remember how I Googled you. Or I don't even remember how I came across you now in your show. But we met each other on Twitter and then reached out to you and you're willing to come on. And you were breaking down the tournament in volleyball, going through the brackets in depth. I was like, this is the dude right here that, that knows. So I got you on, and you came and, and gave your insights, man, and, and dropped all kind of knowledge on there for us. Yes, absolutely. And I was happy to break down the knowledge because the NCAA tournament is kind of like the Christmas when it comes to my show. I know it's <laughs> supposed to be in, in December, but it's always Christmas when we get an NCAA tournament for men's women's or beach volleyball so without any further delay let's get on into this but first just like the previous guest i need to go over the disclaimer these are the thoughts and opinions of myself taryn rodriguez and of Vinny hardy and terry brown and not the opinions of i sports radio bs3 radio cats talk wednesdays university of kentucky or any fourth or fifth party organization so just gotta get that out of the way just in case the anti- Fun police are listening. So, without any further delay, Vinny and Terry, the floor is all yours, as one of my friends would say. Talk about who you two are and what you all do when it comes to your podcast. I mean, I mean we're just two regular guys, I like to say, TV. Uh, what, what, uh, just met on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Vinny sent me a message out of the blue. He said, Hey, how would you like to do a radio show? <laughs> and, I, and I said, okay. You know, uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Neither one of us went to school for journalism or broadcast or anything like that. And it showed. The first six months were brutal. Like we were the only ones listening to each other. It was. It was just. It was. A, it was in bad, bad shape. But we've been doing it for close to eight years, and it's been fantastic. We are. Uh, Vinny likes to say we're two regular dudes, but we've had the ability to to cover from media row. We've covered games and football and basketball and some volleyball and some soccer. So uh, we've gone from two regular guys to, to two guys who have kind of figured it out. Like, I'm not saying we're there. You know, we're not Bob Costas just yet, but we are, <laughs> but we are, we are getting better every time out. So it's, it's been a fun ride. Yes. And we, we did the first, a year and a half of those eight without ever having met in person. Now, these two guys that are national out your way, out on the West Coast, J.T. DeBrick and Tom Looney, I knew one would be in Las Vegas, one would be in Los Angeles, and they would do a, a night sports talk show. And I heard those two, and I was like, wow, these, they are not even together, not even the same state. And that's I was here outside Knoxville, Terry was in Louisville, and we didn't even meet face-to-face for nearly a year and a half. And so that was the early parts of, you know, Cat's Talk Wednesday, too, in the infancy days. They hadn't even met each other. And, and it was tough because you don't realize how much communication is visual cues until you're not in a room with a person. So mm-hmm. it, it took us a while to get a flow, and, and now the show goes really good. We've been fortunate enough to have so many great guests, and that's always the key, right? Whatever your show is, uh, when you when you do this format, it, it's your guest. And we've been fortunate enough to have just a wide range of guests. Uh, Vinny is the man when it comes to that. Like you said, mm-hmm. Vinny, he was looking for someone to break down volleyball. And he said, hey, we got Karen's going to come on and tell us all this stuff about volleyball. I said, great. All I know is Kentucky won. I want to <laughs> know why they won. <laughs> so exactly. we have folks like that. We have. Uh, sports folks from all around the country. Uh, we've had some comedians.
comedians on. Roy Wood Jr., who's on the Daily Show now, uh, called in twice. Uh, we've had Sinbad on. Uh, we've had Dick Vitale on. We've had, uh, oh, the Lee Steinberg. Lee Steinberg. Uh, so we've had some, uh, more well known guests, but we've had people from all over. And so it's really been a joy to do it, you know, for eight years. Yeah, just try to keep it fun and get a guest to, you know, pertinent to whatever's going on or just kind of go off the beaten path and get a musician on that we like their music or something like that. Just, just kind of go where it takes us and try to put out a good show every week that we hope people will enjoy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a fun run. You know, even when we had Lee Steinberg on, the famous agent, I'm trying to talk to him about uh, Jerry Maguire because, you know, it was loosely based on his life. I'm trying to talk to him about Jerry Maguire and the whole interview he's telling us about Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, Patrick Mahomes. Uh-huh. He's like, no, this kid's going to be good. I'm like, okay, okay, wh- whatever you say. <laughs> now back to Jerry Maguire and Tom Cruise. <laughs> and then a few years later, Patrick Mahomes becomes Patrick Mahomes. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it's been fantastic. I've got uh, a, a different appreciation for uh, folks that do this for a living, because, you know, you watch ESPN, and you're like, oh, I could do a sports show. Like, you just sit there, and you just, you know, you talk. How hard can that be? Mm-hmm. But uh, when you have guests, it, it's difficult to come up with questions, right, it, and, and and try to get them to, to talk um, and, and things. So I've learned a lot about that, and, I, and Vinny's the interviewer. He is the the the... The, if you remember the old show Up Close on ESPN <laughs> with Roy Firestone, Vinny, Vinny gets the people talking and then I come in and, you know, and I, you know, I do my thing. So we got a, we got a nice little tag team that we do when we have uh, guests come on. And on, on the flip side of that is you talk about, you know, trying to get the guests to open up and things of that nature. The times, and you say it's easy because all you got to do is talk. The times when, TP and I have went solo for whatever reason when one of us couldn't be on. Like I couldn't be on or TB couldn't be on and I'm trying to just go solo until you have a guest. You you really appreciate those guys that go solo too, like a like a Jim Rohn that does it three hours by himself in the last he's interviewing somebody. You yeah. think you can just talk and then you think you said a lot and only like four minutes have gone by and you're like, Whoa. Still got an hour and six minutes. How am I going to go feel this? So that yeah. you, get, you appreciate all aspects of it with the guest or by yourself and all points in between. Yeah, the first time you did that to me was the last show of the year. And you said, hey, I can't, I can't do it. I said, I got this. It's a year in review. Like, I got to talk about the whole year. So I get set up. I've got my Sports Illustrated and ESPN the magazine. I got websites pulled up. I'm gonna talk about the uh, NCAA champions, and I'm gonna talk about the World Series. I'm gonna talk about the Super Bowl, NBA, Stanley Cup. I did all that. Thirty minutes. <laughs> I still got an hour and a half to fill. So uh, yeah, it's made me uh, appreciate what those folks do, and that's only for two hours a week. Yeah, I can mm. imagine doing it for two or three hours a day. Yeah, so you kind of have to be a little hot takey. Like I don't, you know, I don't begrudge those guys uh, and ladies from kind of going off because it's going to happen, right? You can't do, you know, fifteen hours worth of talking every week because there's really not that much going on uh, mm-hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Great stuff, you guys, and I had no idea you had so many great guests on. It's quite amazing, and. One of my colleagues here at IX Sports Radio actually touched upon this one time. He said one time that doing a show by yourself is very difficult, and he gives kudos to those that do shows by themselves. And it's not easy to just talk to yourself and then just try to keep the flow going for about an hour. But for three hours, woof, man, that, that's... That's intense. So, all right, for you two, how did you all get into contact with Ben Sutterworth III, the founder of BS3 Radio? And what was it like? And what do you remember about that? Ben and I have been 
his friends on Facebook for quite a while. I knew he was down there in the Dallas area, and you just kind of, you know, kind of on social media, you kind of meet people on Twitter that you can tell that you're all trying to do the same thing, all trying to podcast, all trying to do media and come out with content, even though you're not, quote, unquote, you know, professional, you don't work for a newspaper or a website or something like that. You're kind of doing it on the side because you enjoy it. And there's a bunch of people in that mode. Everybody just doing it because they love it and doing it around their regular job and around family. And and so we're all kind of in that boat. Uh, Damien Adams, those guys like that. And then he just kind of reached out and asked if wanted to be part of, of BS3. I think he sent a DM one time and um, so, you know, talked about all different platforms he could put the show on and, you know, how he helped promote other podcasts and everything he did at the network and, um, had made the move from Blog Talk over to Anchor and just went with it, rode with it and been, been rocking with DS3 and gotten to know some of the other shows, had been on our show. Um, I got to be part of the little family feud show with us and against the, uh, the X-Squad radio group. So it's just, it's just been cool. Uh, Ben's a good dude. And everybody that's under that little podcast umbrella are all good folks, too. All of us, you know, just doing what we enjoy doing and, and having fun with it and trying to do a good job and get better each and every time we do a show. Awesome stuff. So let's talk about Kentucky season. So I think at one point Kentucky eventually won – 42 consecutive sets. Like, I don't know if you two kind of knew that right off the bat, but when it comes to the Kentucky women's volleyball regular season, how impressed were you that they only dropped one match to its rival Florida? I was I was pretty impressed uh, because, as we say on the show, and I know with Oklahoma and Texas doing their dance now, a lot of folks don't want to hear it, but the SEC has become kind of king. But it's not just football, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's If you can compete in the SEC, you are a national power. So Kentucky had gotten to the point where they won three, four SEC championships in a row. Mm-hmm. And I know for a lot of us, we were kind of waiting for that next step, right? But we know kind of out west, Nebraska, some of the California teams where volleyball is really, really big. You know, that was always like the roadblock. They'd always run into, you know, the Monstars, if you will. <laughs> yep. But this year just felt – I know, I had to get that Space Jam plug in, right? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. But, but, but this year it just – it felt different. And uh, even though, you know, COVID, we're all dealing with that, just from the video, from just the way they were approaching, they were celebrating the win. But it was like, okay, we've got more stuff to do. And, again, being late onto the volleyball scene, it was very reminiscent, because we're Kentucky fans, of some of the really good Kentucky basketball teams that we've had, where you just reach a point where it's not so much they're playing the opponent in front of them, they're getting ready for something else. And that's the way it felt uh, as I was following along in the volleyball team this year. Yeah, I was, you know, kind of like Terry, you know, just, Keep up with it a little bit. I was trying to learn about it a little late arriving. Knew they were gradually uh, continuing to build, you know, getting momentum. We kind of peeped at them when it got to tournament time, and you know they were, uh, you know, getting getting knocked out. They were just like they said, trying to get over that hump. Uh, seeing the talent, seeing you know Leah Edmonds and those types of players coming in, and. Uh, just when time and time would come and just kind of check them out, and, oh, man, they just weren't quite able to do it. Weren't quite able to do it. So then, you know, this year ended up being the year, and it was just a, a fun ride to be able to to uh, to be a part of. And it kind of filled the void for, for basketball. Basketball did not go well, and they kind of jumped in in the spring of the year and gave us that March Madness scratch that itch that we're just Kentucky basketball fans are accustomed to and they they did it on the volleyball side. So they, they kind of step in and say, We got y'all basketball, we'll pick you up and <laughs> give BBM uh, a little spring madness tournament 
championship plays for everybody. Yes, that was great stuff. And they kind of find and they actually won the first ever NCAA Women's Volleyball Championship in the SEC because pretty much the NCAA Women's Volleyball was pretty much won in the Pac-12 or the Big Ten or the Big 12. And, like, what was that feeling like when you saw Kentucky clinch the match in that championship match? Well, it was it was a relief for Kentucky fans. Uh, it was an up and down in between the the, the final four match and the, the, I guess the semifinal championship match. That's when Terrence Clark got it, and mm-hmm. it was a roller coaster of emotions of uh, because with no men's basketball playing, Kentucky fans were looking for something, right? And so mm-hmm. we're following along with the women. I think the Purdue game was in the Elite Eight when they came back and stormed, and everybody's tweeting about that, and then uh, with Terrence Clark passing, it was just the bottom had been taken out of everybody. And so the next day when Kentucky's playing Texas, I, I, you know, we interact with a lot of people online, obviously, and it was, it was like a basketball game. I had never seen anything, football, anything, kind of the way the online chatter was for the volleyball team, the win. They were actually able to, to, to hold off Texas in the win. It was a relief, obviously. And, you know, uh, another championship, the second championship for Kentucky uh, this year after the rifle team, so two national championships in one year. Mm-hmm. And for the SEC, like I said, if you can compete in the SEC, you are competing for a national championship. You know, like I said, everybody focuses on football, but baseball this year, like, it, it just means more. I know it sounds hokey. I know people don't want to hear that, but it, it, it does mean something. I wrote an article uh, for justacats.com, a website, uh, a Kentucky website, and I, the title was something like, to the effect of, Kentucky Volleyball gives us that same old feeling. And it was, it was just way before your time, Taryn, but there's an old song by the Jazz Crusaders. I used to listen to my dad's vinyl album. And the piano player Joe Sample and all those guys, but they had a song called "Keep That Same Old Feeling." It's real smooth, little little jazz groove. You might want to check it out after the show. But I, you know, what I was talking about is the volleyball team, like I mentioned earlier, gave us that same old feeling that we usually feel in March come basketball time. You get to the tournament, you know, your, your first round match. You know, you you handle business, and they they kind of blew them out. But you know it's the tournament. You know everybody's good. You you know Kentucky's a good seed. They're pretty much seeding where they should be, or maybe they're not. You know, that's how it is in basketball. That nervousness, that excitement, as you progress, as you get to the round of 32, as you get to the Sweet 16, as you get to the Elite Eight, that same feeling of excitement was there, even though I'm not familiar with the terms and everything how the sport of volleyball plays out. The pace of play, it was just points all the time. It was it, the excitement was there. So in a sense, like I said, it, that same feeling that we grown up with, most of us our entire lives as Kentucky basketball fans, volleyball came in and gave us that same feeling, that same old feeling. And to be the first SEC school to do it. I mean you, you can't you can't ever have another first to do it. Kentucky's always gonna be the first SEC school and volleyball to win that chip, and so that's just that's just extra special. Indeed, it was, and obviously, I make note of Kentucky's one and only loss being to Florida in a five set match in Tallahassee. Do you two think there is such thing as a good loss when it comes to any sport? Well, see, this this is <laughs> this is a this is a debate that that that's raging within Kentucky fans. Because yeah. we remember uh, 2015, the Kentucky uh, men's basketball team went 38-1. And so that team was very, very good, right? Mm-hmm. And once it got to maybe 22 or 23 games, this debate trickled on like they need to have a loss. They need to have a loss to, to, to take the edge off and to help them focus. But then you go through the regular season undefeated, and you're like, 
Well, we can't lose anymore, right? So it, it, I, I, I think you win as many games as you can, right? I, I just think you, you, you do that. That's me. I don't believe there's a good loss, although, you know, showing my age going back to 1996, that team won 27 games in a row, dropped the SEC tournament title, and ended up winning the championship. 2012 also <laughs> lost the SEC championship game. So I, I don't know. But it, that is a topic for debate that I don't know we'll ever have a resolution on. Yeah, and, and supposedly the coaches – or, or cool with it. Supposedly Rick Pitino was glad they lost to Mississippi State in the in the SEC tournament because it it refocused them. And yeah, now all we got to do is win six in a row. We've we've had a twenty plus game winning streak. Now we just got to win six to win a title, no problem. So yeah, that's that like Terry said. That's an age old back and forth. You got people on each side of it, and the exact same thing. Maybe to be said, or maybe that Florida lost. Refocus Coach Skinner and everybody to to go ahead and go on this title run. Exact same kind of scenario. Yes, and you also look at other undefeated teams that were undefeated before losing in the NCAA tournament. You look at Gonzaga men's basketball, which wound up losing in the championship match to Baylor in blowout fashion. You look at Wisconsin women's volleyball that wound up losing in the semifinals to Texas. I think everyone and their mothers had Wisconsin in the final because, and everyone was picking Wisconsin to win the whole thing where they kind of unfortunately tripped over Texas. So there's that. And if there's any consolas to that loss to Florida for Kentucky, it didn't truly matter because Florida's chances of winning the SEC was slim to none, considering they had two early losses back in the fall where they lost to South Carolina in five sets, and they lost to Georgia, which didn't even come close to having a good season, in four sets. So basically that was their loss where they just got it out of the way and they just regrouped, and the next day they actually swept Florida at Florida. So there was no problem for Kentucky, in my opinion. Right. It's, 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 it's chicken or the egg. There's points on both sides, but, you know, that 2015 loss, that stings. That's the one that stings everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Indeed. So, we now they jump to the NCAA tournament. So, the first, well, they didn't, Kentucky actually had a bye. The first three rounds, they just swept away their opponents. Like, nothing was getting in the way of Kentucky. Not even Western Kentucky. But then they kind of ran into a toughie against Washington, which was the team that beat them in last year's NCAA tournament. So when you were worried in that, I don't know if you two saw the match, but in the third set when Washington was up and they were about to go two up 2-1 two on, on Kentucky, what was going through your head had you seen that match? Or if you saw that match? Well, for, for me, again, I, I, I'm a big body language guy. And I, when I think of championship teams, I kind of look at, okay, when the other team pushes them, how do they react? Are the players yelling at each other? Is the coach yelling? What what are we seeing? I, I know it's not a perfect science, but I saw Coach Skinner and his staff, they just they stayed composed, right? And, 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 and I said to myself, I'm not going to get worked up until they get worked up. And they were able to steady the course. And they needed that resolve as they progressed through the tournament. Because, like I said, I don't know anything about volleyball. I, You know, my volleyball knowledge kind of begins and ends with the beach volleyball scene and Top Gun. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm trying to learn. <laughs> so, That's true. I, you know, my thing is I'm going to react when they react. And they didn't. I was able to do a show with Gabby Curry, the All-American, All-Everything, uh, I was able to do a show with her and her dad, and just I asked her, and she said, "No, we weren't. You know, we weren't. We weren't worried. We just knew we had to play Kentucky volleyball, and then we would win." And I'm like, "That's great, you know that uh, level of confidence that even though the boat gets a little rocky, you just stay the course. They're like if we do what we need to do, we're going to win." And I just I, I love that. So even though I was watching 
you know, the Washington and Purdue and, and, and everything like that, I'd say, hey, if they're not worried, I'm not worried. Yeah, and, and I think we even asked, we had Leah Edmond on with us on Cast Talk Wednesday and just asking about you know, Coach Skinner because the dude, like Terry said, is just stoic. And, but underneath is the, all the intensity and the competitive fire and, and the drive. And she kind of, you know, reiterated that. You know, they joke with him and, and mess with him and, and bust his chops. And, you know, she gives him crap about, you know, if it wasn't for your wife, I wouldn't even be here because she's the one that kept telling you to recruit me and all that kind of stuff. But when it was game time, like Terry said, and, and we're thinking, oh, maybe it's time to panic. And they never did. Just stoic, stone face. No problem the whole time. Demeanor never changed. So that, and obviously, it worked for us watching. So no doubt that calm, you know, permeated through the team. And, and it, it reminded me, I'm a Lakers guy. Yes, uh, it reminded me of Phil Jackson. Oh, Lord. Oh. You know, Phil Jackson, you know, the other team would go on a run, and he wouldn't call timeout. He's basically like, you know what to do. <laughs> you figure it out, right? Like. You know, you know, sometimes it was a little too cool for school, but <laughs> if you practice and if you've got a game plan you know works, you don't need to scream about it. You just say, hey, hey, this is what we worked on. This is what we need to do. And what struck me was, and I'm looking ahead a little bit to the championship match against Texas, when Texas was making the run, and one of the commentators on the, SC, on the network said, uh, on ESPN, I should say, uh, you know, if you're Texas, where do you go? And the, the, the lady, I can't remember the, the woman that was doing this, said, oh, I don't know. If you go here, Kentucky's got this person. If you go here, Kentucky said, you know, like your options of what you can do are just limited. I was like, oh, again, I don't know volleyball, but this sounds pretty darn good to me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yep. So this will be the last volleyball question, and then we're going to have a little fun here. So, well, we're going to have more fun, but – are you excited for the up and coming Kentucky women's volleyball season, even though they kind of graduated quite a bit of players? I am. I've got two girls, and my girls are 12 and 15, which makes me an old person. But we, I took them to volleyball games on top of other sports because uh, my oldest is 5'10, five 5'11. Foot foot she's as tall as I am, she's, mm. she's right here with me. So I wanted them to see tall women athletes. Like, you, it's okay to be tall, right? So we go to uh, Memorial Coliseum where they play the game, and I'm excited about that atmosphere. The fans will be back. The fans will be rowdy. And mm-hmm. Kentucky fans are nothing if not passionate. And I know what we used to do with kind of – I don't want to say small crowds. They were decent crowds. I'm ready for that place to be rocking. You know, we, uh, Kentucky finished uh, number 14 in the uh, Director's Cup standings. And so another good, strong finish from volleyball could be right back, you know, top 15 again. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and they did They did lose a lot, but they you know still got quite a bit coming back and – I was just kind of cruising through the roster, and you know, Elise Goatfinger, Maddie Skinner, Ali Stumler, Zani Teeler got some good experience on, en route to the title last year. Uh, I even looked ahead. I'm not a big recruiting guy, Tan, but um, I saw where Coach Skinner tweeted out on July the 17th, feeling good about the future, go Cats. And then he mm-hmm. quote tweeted his own tweet. On July 22nd, he said, just got this feeling again. Go Cats. And then I see um, where a Brooklyn DeLive from Washburn Rural High School in Topeka, Kansas, committed class of 23, uh, 6'2". So you probably know the high school ranks and know what type of player she's going to be, but she's already committed to be uh, a Kentucky Wildcat. Coach Skinner tweeting about happy and feeling good about the future. Going to have the target on their back as the champs, but Mm -hmm. sounds like they're going to be ready for that challenge. Yeah, and I think they're going to have a great season. I mean, if they don't have 
the ideal season next year, which I think they'll still be competitive. Like, obviously in the SEC you have Florida, and but that's about it. Like, Missouri is eh. Missouri is eh. Tennessee is kind of meh. And then who else is challenging Kentucky other than Florida? Hardly anybody, in my opinion. So that's just me, though. So, all right. So let's steer away from the volleyball questions, and let's have a little fun here. So you two are located in Kentucky, Lexington, or Kentucky, you know, in all, all in all. So I need to know, as a foodie myself, where are the best places to go when it comes to getting some good grub in Kentucky? Terry's a city guy, so I'll let him go first. Well, you know, I, I think if you're going to come to Kentucky, I, I think something you should check off is you have to go down to Corbett, Kentucky, and, and see the first KFC restaurant. <laughs> you know, I, I know it's not considered fine dining, blah, 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 but it's, it's KFC. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I, I would say if you're in Kentucky, to eat at the, at the KFC. Uh, in Louisville, man, there's so many really good places. I love the Muscle Burger and uh, Oyster Bar. Uh, they got a couple of locations here in town. Uh, I, I love that. That's a good date night for me. Not too expensive, but the food is really, really good. Gives you different uh, kinds of burgers and oysters to eat. So that would be my go-to. Man, oh, and Terry's from Louisville. I grew up in a small town in Southeast of Kentucky, and Terry referenced Corbin, which is in Southeast of Kentucky, and I'm going to cross-reference and mention Louisville because I was just up there the other day, and my sister had been telling me about this place that our uncle had taken her to, and it's, it's called Mike Lennig's, and it's just yeah. so simple, just white fish, cod, homemade tartar sauce, they do seafood as well, and I'm a big eater. I'm not like a big guy, but I can, you know, I can eat. And so when they said you get two pieces of fish, I'm like, man, I don't know if two pieces of fish is going to be no. Those two pieces of fish were like, I mean, it, it was ridiculous how big those pieces of fish were. So you had way, the portions were huge. The coleslaw was great. It was all delicious. So in Louisville, Mike Lennox, so I, I referenced a spot in TB City. He references a spot in Southeast Kentucky where I'm from. So that's cool how that worked out. And in Lexington, when I got to where, you know, we mentioned we get to cover games, get to cover football games, basketball games. And we, uh, we both like to get there early. You know, when the, when the players are warming up and the fans are just not able to go in, I would go early and stop at a place called Stella's Kentucky Deli. It's about a half mile from Rupp Arena. It's just a in an old house, everything's homemade, and if you want to come to Kentucky and try Kentucky food, you want to get yourself uh, a hot brown, which is just a, a delicious turkey sandwich. The, the hot brown there at Stella's Kentucky Deli is great. The burgoo, which is like a Kentucky-specific stew, soup kind of dish, is good there as well. So I'm going to put a plug in for Stella's Kentucky Deli right there in Lexington. Mm-hmm. All right, great stuff. So a couple more questions, and then I'll, then I'll let you two go. All right, so what are some notable places or events that happen in Kentucky? And it could be anywhere in Kentucky, whether it's Lexington, Louisville, other than, like, sports and whatnot, uh, and, or unless there's, like, a big-time sporting event. So, But anyway, well, yeah. The, 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 big, the big sporting event, obviously, is the Kentucky Derby. Oh, yeah, that's I do true. Rec- recommend folks get to – at least one time, I, the the infield is a big party. So if you are my age, don't plan on going to the infield because it ain't for us. <laughs> uh, but the, the beautiful thing about Louisville is uh, for the last six years, we have what we call a cultural pass for kids. And they get these passes, and they're able to go to museums and do activities all throughout the city. So you learn about your city. I know others cities have kind of adopted the same kind of thing. So I was able to do that with my girls and learn a lot. Uh, happy birthday. You know, the happy birthday to you song was written in Louisville. And so we we went to the place where that was written by the two sisters, and their names escaped me, but we got to do that. Uh, obviously, there's the Bat Factory. Uh, 
uh, that is uh, Louisville Slugger that is fantastic. 25 years of operation. That's great. Uh, the Muhammad Ali Museum. You can't yeah. say Louisville without Muhammad Ali. He is uh, Louisville's favorite son. So, uh, so those are things that you can do. And there's, you know, we've got uh, the park system in Louisville is one of the best. Uh, the, the, the guy that designed uh, Olmstead, that designed Central Park in New York, along with other parks in some other cities, designed Louisville's park system. So the city park system is, is absolutely fantastic. So Louisville's got a lot to offer. You pop out of the state, especially in the fall, every, every little town or community has their own individual specific kind of fall festival. You know, if you go to Hazard, they got the Black Gold Festival. Uh, you go to Pikeville, it's the Hillbilly Days in the fall. Each little town has their own little thing. There's arts, there's crafts, there's cool things to see and do and good food to eat. Um, Kentucky's known for, like, like TV said, the Kentucky Derby. You have a bat factory, the Ollie Center. You know, Kentucky basketball, everybody knows about that. Kentucky's also known for bourbon. So you want to hit the bourbon trail, you can try all the different distilleries and see how the bourbon is made and get but, a little but sample. Taste yourself. And take, taste yourself. <laughs> if you're going to the bourbon trail, taste yourself because you know, one or two a day. Yeah, you go to two and then you're then you're having some fun. Then you become a little rambunctious and it's not just tasting, you are having a full on party. So just a word to the wise. It's like you go to California to the to the wine country, you, you don't want to do a whole bunch. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. I definitely agree. Oh, sorry. It's just a few, few of fun things you can get out and about and try in Kentucky. Mm, I will definitely make note of that, and I one day want to visit Kentucky, not just for like at the sports, but maybe just to, like look around. So great stuff, you two. All right, so and, and man, all the all the horse farms in Central Kentucky, just driving out and seeing all the. Picket fences and rolling hills and horses out there. You'll you'll love that scenery too, Jared. Mm. Duly noted. So, all right. So before we wrap up, I got one more question for you all, and it's basically going to be the cherry on top. So I know we're pretty much past the pandemic for the worst part of it, but ever since this whole pandemic started, there was this one item in particular that just vanished off the store shelves it just whooshed off the shelves like no one knew what happened to this one particular item it just not even the smartest people at stanford knew about this so Vinny and terry i ask you this when this whole pandemic started did you too have enough toilet paper <laughs> I, I i did when when uh, it first went, they said, they said you're going to lock down in place and be in your own bubble and all this kind of stuff. I moved in with my mom. Uh, Mama B, who I tweet about all the time, mm. she's wonderful. But the one thing about old people is they're going to have some TP. So she had TP like it was going out of style already. So we were good from the jump. So we didn't have to run out and try to, try to hoard it up. So we did a, a pretty good job with that from the get-go. We stayed stocked somehow. I don't even remember how because it was so weird when you would you would go to the store and see the shelves. You know, at, at one point there was no chicken. At one point there was no this, and you just see the supermarket like just get ransacked, like it, something out of a movie. But you're, you're looking at it in real life and. You, see all these signs, it's just one this per customer, one that. You see stuff on ration. It's like, whoa, mm-hmm. this is crazy. Um, I, we we never ran out. I mean, sometimes you didn't, maybe don't have the brand you were accustomed to or just some different kind of stuff, but you still were able to, to make it and, and, and have sufficient amounts to take care of business throughout the entire length of the shelter in place. Got it. Yeah, it's so it's good that you two didn't had enough. It's good that you two had enough toilet paper. I certainly had yeah, enough man. when uh, the whole pandemic started, and it was crazy, man. But that's gonna yeah. do it for this little interview. Thank you, Vinny and Terry. 
Um, before we head to a commercial, both of you, would you like to plug in your information and where these lovely Kentucky fans can find you on Twitter and plug in your show as well? Hey, you can't talk Wednesday. Uh, we record every Wednesday evening, like you mentioned, on Anchor. Uh, anchor.com. Just go in and search Cat Talk Wednesday. Um, at Cat Talk Wednesday on Twitter, Cat Talk W E D. And mine personally is at Vinny with a Y, Hardy with a Y. Mm hmm. And you can reach me at T Brown underscore 80. As at T Brown underscore eight zero eighty four Jerry Rice. So that's where you can see me with my daily ranting and and, and raving. <laughs> great stuff and great stuff. And where could they find your uh, podcast? Uh, um, Anchor dot com is the app, and then you know, under that BS three umbrella, um, from Spotify and. Uh, Oh, so many, so many platforms. I'm blanking on them right now, but it's, it's tons of different podcast platforms. That I think it's Breaker and Overcast and uh, just for them a few. It's on iHeartRadio as well. You can go to iHeartRadio and, and, and um, type in Cat Talk Wednesday and all the episodes are there as well. All kinds of different places to be able to find each and every episode from the first one eight years ago to the one we did last week. So this coming Wednesday's upcoming episode, so yeah, they're all going to be there. All right, great stuff. And you can follow the entire Twitter account of Cats Talk Wednesdays on Twitter, at Cats Talk, and then the word W-E-D. And they're also on Facebook as well. So thank you once again, Vinny and Terry. We're actually going to take ourselves a quick little commercial break. When we come back, I will have the origination and story of of Set Point. So you're listening to the 100th episode of Set Point here on IA Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me and hear me good. If you like sports, then you like the Wait a Minute Show. If you like comedy, then you like the Wait a Minute Show. If you like a different opinion coming from a different angle, then you like the Wait a Minute Show. So join me Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with your host, Jelani J.B. Bodie. And of course, my man Lopan on the Wait a Minute Show.com. Ain't that right, Lopan? What's going on, football fans? This is me, your boy Larry B, inviting you to join myself, Callum Reynolds, Mike Pat, and John Felipe for one of the most electrifying football shows you have ever heard. Three and out, right here at IE Sports Radio. Recap of the week before, a preview of what's to come, and of course, three hardcore head to head prom time face offs. Each week, you don't want to miss it. Hey, what's up, sports fans? You're looking for a different type of sports talk show? Something you haven't heard before? gotta check out the BS3 Sports Show every other Saturday on 2 Live Stews Radio 1 p.m. Central Time 2 p.m. Eastern Sports Talk at its finest always have great guests playing some good hip hop you don't want to miss it make sure to tune in to the BS3 Sports Show every other Saturday at 1 p.m. Central Time 2 p.m. Eastern And welcome back to the 100th episode of Set Point. Big thank you to Vinny Hardy and Terry T.B. Brown of Cats Talk Wednesdays 
a show that is on our neighbor station, BS3 Radio, for to being a guest here on Set Point. Gotta give him a little love. And also, once again, thank you to Craig Pizzanti for being a guest, the first guest here on our 100th episode. So let's give some love to those guys. <laughs> So we actually have one more guest coming. That's going to be coming on. Yes, I have one more guest, but he's going to be on a little later. Let's just say he has work, and unfortunately, I can't do anything about that. So, regardless, let's get on into the story slash origin of Set Point. But first, 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 we have ourselves a sponsor. We have to go over. And it's the official sponsor of IE Sports Radio, and that sponsor is the Southern California Warriors semi-pro football team. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get film to try out for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just staying to keep their butts in shape. No matter what happens, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you have been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow the Southern California Warriors on Twitter at SoCal Warriors, and you can follow them on Instagram at Southern California underscore Warriors, and then you can also find them on Facebook by typing the word Southern the word California, and then the word Warriors. So thank you to SoCal Warriors for being the official sponsor of IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And you can give IE Sports Radio a follow on social media as well. They're available on Instagram and Facebook at IE Sports Radio. And if you go to Facebook, just type in the words IE, the word sports, and then radio. So definitely Give iSports Radio a follow because we are all just podcasters who love to do this whole sports podcast shindig. And also, we are for the people, by the people. So, now that that's out of the way, it's time for a little story time with Taryn. Yes, I like to title it that just because that's just me. So, story time with Taryn. So, now... We're going to talk a little about how Set Point got to be. So this isn't going to be the traditional episode of Set Point. So we're not going to have any transfer talk, unfortunately. Just because we've had ourselves a big show, we had four guests, and then I talked a little about the Olympics of how TJ DeFalco was on the was on the men's team and how Josh Tuaniga was an alternate with uh, the Team USA with Craig Pizzanti. And then also Brandon Sander, who also played for Craig Pizzanti in Huntington Beach. So there's that. So let's get on into the origination of Set Point. So for those that don't know, I actually didn't start off doing Set Point. I actually started off being a co-host for Bases Loaded with Brandon Buckingham and Blake Henley, who are still going strong with Set... Or not Set Point, Bases Loaded. Yeah. So... Eventually, I moved on from bases loaded. It just didn't work out for myself, so I had to. I and at the time that I was with the uh, bases loaded boys, Brandon and Blake, I was also the co-host for Defining Moment with Larry B. So I actually eventually moved on from bases loaded, and then I actually got the chance to being a co-host for Fast Break, which was originally hosted by Phil and Phil, Phil Jones and Phil Robinson, who were formerly of IE Sports Radio, but are currently doing their own thing. So I actually got to do one episode of Fast Break with Phil Jones and Phil Robinson. Um, Unfortunately, at the time, Phil and Phil decided to keep Fast Break and do it themselves, which I was disappointed in just because, fun fact about me, basketball was my big favorite pastime and my favorite sport when I was growing up, so... I eventually was doing Defining Moment with Larry B, but our schedules weren't coinciding with one another, sadly. So, at, at the time, he just said he wanted to do Defining Moment himself, and then I basically had to, like, step up and say, hey, you recruited me to podcast. Like, how come I'm not getting my shows? It's like, I want to podcast. I want to 
do this thing. I don't want to like. I, I, it's like you recruited me for a reason, and you said you want you were looking for a podcaster. It's like I'm not podcasting because I'm not with Bases Loaded. I'm not with Fast Break. I'm not with you anymore. So what the heck, man? So he eventually got the idea of giving me my own show. That was the greatest thing I could have ever heard. One problem, however. Football was taken, basketball was taken, baseball was taken, hockey at the time was taken, soccer was taken, and I didn't want to have like my own sports show, which it would have been unoriginal anyway. So at the time, we actually had our own miscellaneous sports talk show called Not What It Seems with former iSports radio host Caitlin Seams. So at the time, Larry and I were thinking, what show am I going to do because everything is taken? So he eventually came up with the idea of giving me a volleyball show. And I'm like, all right, that'll work. And at first, I'm going to be 100% honest with you all. I was an amateur when it came to doing set point. For starters, I was very sloppy. I, I didn't know how to go about this because this was my first ever thing doing it all by myself. At least with bases loaded, I had Brandon and Blake to back me up. And then with Defining Moment, I had Larry B. But this was my own show, and I didn't know what to do with it. I was making rookie mistakes. First and foremost, I was actually stealing catchphrases from some of my colleagues. It's like, oops, um, I bad. So that's how amateuristic I was. And, ugh... And then second and foremost, I made another big mistake where I had my show at a not-so-convenient time. I had it in the AM, which it was originally aired on Mondays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time. Now, that's not a bad time. However, everyone's at, like, school or work or doing things. So it's kind of not the most ideal time slot to put it in. But at the time... On Mondays, I couldn't put it at 5 p.m. just because I think uh, yeah, Unfiltered Truth was on at the time, number one. And then number two, I had a 5 p.m. class that – I yeah, a class at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So it was a no-go. So I had to put it on someplace. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday were just out of the question just because I was super busy. So there's that right there. So here's the thing about set point. I – like I said, I was very amateuristic. Another mistake I had was I actually did two episodes a week. At first, I wanted to do two episodes a week just to like recap the matches from this week and then get to the closing matches of like Saturday and Sunday. I even did set point on Saturdays at 9 or 10 a.m. That right there is a red flag for multiple reasons. Number one... People are not going to wake up at, like, 9 or 10 a.m. Pacific time. I mean, I guess you're awake at, on the East Coast, but they're not going to wake up to watch, to listen to a volleyball podcast on a Saturday. Second of all, you're doing another show two times a week, which you kind of don't really want to do that, because if you're doing that, you might as well just do it daily. And I can't do it daily. And then number three, no one is going to... Everyone is probably watching Saturday morning cartoons college football, or they're just out having a great time at the beach, or they're just watching a college football game on TV, or they're watching it in person. Regardless, I was very, again, I made very amateuristic mistakes, and I was very new to podcasting with this by myself. And then also the worst part was that I didn't really get a whole lot of feedback when it came to this show like when i first did set point i didn't really receive too much feedback i received a little i eventually found out that i downloaded something that was making my computer run slow and i was sounding choppy i remember this from larry b himself he said you sound a little choppy but you sound good so i had to like search through my computer and then lo and behold i found something i didn't even download and it's like hey this isn't supposed to be here so i eventually got rid of that and then I looked good, or sounded good. So, at the time when I was doing Set Point, I was just having fun. I just wanted to get out there and just just relieve myself. I think I saw this in the chat room, where Adam basically said this in the chat room. He said, uh, solo radio can be scary, but it could also be freeing. 
that's actually a very, very, very good point. Number one, because you get to just say what you want to say. And number two, without a leash, of course. And then number two, you basically could just let it out. So, again, at the time I was just wanting to have fun and just trying to be my own person. And then when I... And then I just wanted to, like, see the... I needed to eventually see the big picture. Like, another mistake I made was, in, like, the NCAA tournament, I thought it was an, an ideal idea... Ideal idea. Interesting. It, I thought it was a good idea to have a show the day of each, like, day. Like, the round of 64, then the round of 32, then the round of 16... So on, so on, so on, so on, so on, and so forth. And it's like, oops. <laughs> again, that again, and like my, like I said, if you're gonna do a show on more than one day, you might as well either do it daily, or you might as well just have like do it on like a Monday or a Sunday to like one re- preview the matches, and then two or preview whatever you're planning to preview, and then two do it on Sunday to have, like, a recap of the week, and then just give your thoughts and opinions. Like, I'm no show expert. Like, I'm no Stephen A. Smith or anything like that. But... I eventually had to learn the hard way, and I eventually caught these mistakes by myself, and I'm still to this day wondering... Oops. <laughs> so there's that. So eventually I was I was just having fun at the time. I was just wanting to get on there just because I wanted to have fun. And even though it meant balancing out school, I eventually was happy with it. And I'm like, awesome stuff. So honestly, it was, it was great. And then I eventually stumbled across something when it came to the Spreaker website, and I found statistics, and this was kind of another dumb decision on my part, but it was kind of eye-opening. I actually found the statistics to every show, and then I saw my show, I'm like, I want to see my numbers when it comes to this show. And then I saw that my numbers weren't the hottest, and I'm like, oh, dang. So, I eventually just clicked the X. Exp- I did not... I don't think I've clicked the close button on my screen ever so quickly, and I'm like, dang. (laughs) It's kind of like going to a website, I think it's called Volley Talk, I want to say. It was, it's a website for, like, high school volleyball players, and everyone just talks volleyball 24-7, and then sometimes people just like to talk smack on certain teams, and then something like that. But that uh, experience, when I saw the statistics, and I saw my numbers weren't on, I'm like, dang. What am I doing wrong? And then, eventually, I just hit a wall, and I'm like, you know, this ain't, this isn't, like, happy to me. It's like, I wasn't having fun at the time. And then, I needed to, like, find the errors of my way. So, I consulted Larry B, and I'm like, how am I going to get my show to getting better? And then, he first and foremost told me, I need to stop stealing everyone's catchphrases. That was done. Second and foremost, I need to pick a time that's not really 11 a.m. Pacific time. So I had to think, what's a good time for me? And then I'm like, why not Monday at 5 p.m.? And I actually got a little help from one of my other colleagues. And he basically said, why not pick the 5 p.m. to like 7 p.m. slot? That's basically prime time. Even though he eventually said every time is prime time. So I decided to switch it to like, 5 p.m., and it's like, cool. So I eventually got used to it, and at the time where I just felt defeated, where I just hit that wall, I just thought to myself, I actually, th- and don't be alarmed by this, everybody, I actually thought about stopping set point. It's like, I hit a wall. I really hit a wall, and I'm like, I don't know about this. Like, first and foremost, school is a thing, work is a thing, and me having to shuffle my show around, like, tens of thousands of times is not really the most convenient thing. So, and it's just getting too much to the point where I'm just feeling burnt out and I'm not having fun. And then I thought to myself, well, I've got two options here. Number one, I could just quit and fold. Number two, I could just suck it up and just find ways to just make it work no matter what the circumstances. It's clearly obvious I chose option number two and I said, 
I'm going to continue to do this. Because I didn't know too many volleyball shows at the time. And I'm like, yeah. So I eventually got back into my groove. And everything was going all hunky-dory. I was very happy. Until the pandemic hit in 2020. Um, By the way, when I hit my wall, this was back in 2020 of January. And then the pandemic happened in 2020 in March. And then... Every volleyball thing was gone. Well, postponed or canceled. As in, high school volleyball was canceled, college volleyball was canceled, even junior college volleyball in California was canceled. So, it's like, well, what am I going to do? It's like, I, I don't have much volleyball to talk about. So, I try to keep it going with my show. I try to be very unique, which it eventually heard. So, it, it eventually kept the show going despite... No volleyball being played in the entire universe. But then my material was starting to run dry, and I needed an idea on how I can continue to get my show going without having to take a break. And an interesting fact about this show is that the last time Set Point took the week off was March 2nd, 2020, when I had to tell Larry B, and I said, Larry B, I have to take this week off. I have too much going on with school and whatnot. I'm sorry, man. And he was like, sure, it's all right, dude. And then ever since March 2nd, 2020, I haven't had a week off for set point. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing, because number one, everyone needs a week off because of things. And number two, it's a good thing because you're a consistent show. So... I don't know. Maybe it's because I was still pumping on adrenaline, and I found my groove back, and I'm like, we're back, and I am ready to kick some volleyball tail feathers. So, back to me trying to find new material. I was wondering, how am I going to get new material for set point? Because I was running low on ideas. And then I eventually heard the extra mile, and they were having guests left and right. And I'm like, you know what? I have friends that could talk some volleyball. So I eventually started small with, like, local high school reporters. And then I eventually wanted to get bigger. I eventually got my my good friend who was the sports editor of the Daily 49er, the school newspaper that I worked for at the time. And then I started to think even bigger as I wanted to get Alan Knight, the head coach of Long Beach State, men's volleyball, and then Travis Turner, the head coach of Orange Coast College men's volleyball, that's a junior college by the way, and then I eventually got Steve Astor, the assistant women's volleyball coach at Pepperdine, and then the list went on and on, and one of my other guests was also Craig Pizzanti, who was on episode 49, and I, I wanted to keep the show going, I'm like, you know, I've I've gone this far, I'm not going to stop, no matter what the circumstance is. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it pushing. And I eventually did not want to stop no matter what the circumstance was. So eventually, I also also told this story on the 50th episode, but I kind of didn't go too in-depth. But I also do remember something that Marcus Los Great once told me, and he was in the chat room for my 50th episode. He said, a house is not built overnight, Taryn. And he's right. And Obviously, a volleyball show is tough to do, because first of all, volleyball isn't really televised nationally, like football, basketball, baseball, soccer, hockey, the list goes on and on. It's tough. Like, you have to have, like, a certain, what, sports channel, like the Pac-12 network or the Big Ten network, etc., etc. Like, it's tough. So the fact that I had to try to make this work, and even though I had tough days where it's like, dang... Like, what am I doing wrong, man? Like, I still couldn't believe to this day, I still couldn't believe to this day that I didn't really get the best feedback until, like, I think it was about, like, episode 23 where I was just wondering, what the heck am I doing wrong? And big shout out to Larry B for telling me the error of my ways and how I needed to just keep it going. So I eventually had to start thinking of my own catchphrases, which is hence me saying, what is up, everybody, every single way. And that is pretty much what I stuck with for the most part. And then I couldn't really think of a good outro until I just pretty much, I had to like shuffle many, many like outros and eventually use the term volley on, which I think was 
old and stale, but as you all heard in my introduction, I actually have a new opening catchphrase called, Set up the net, hand me a volleyball, because I'm about to serve you some volleyball action. So, (laughs) it just goes to show how far this show has come, and I've had so many guests on this show, and I've learned a lot when doing this show. I've learned it's never easy, and it's success is going to take time. As Marcus said, he, he basically said it, said it best. A house isn't built overnight. And honestly, I couldn't agree with him more, honestly. And I think whenever I have a rough day, when it comes to this show or my other show, SoCal Supreme Sports Show, I go back to that statement and I just think Marcus is right. And it's a show is never, or a house is never built. So... And I know I'm not the best volleyball guy. I'm not like a diehard volleyball fan. I'm just an overall good sports guy. But at the time, I wanted to do a... Larry thought it was a great idea to do a volleyball show. And he even said in the chat room, One of the best decisions I ever made in this network was give you your own show, man. And look how far you've taken it. Look how far you've taken the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. You're the man, Taryn. You're a legend in IESR. I appreciate it, Larry. Because if you had told me on September 30th, 2019, I was going to have 100 episodes of Set Point, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have said, hey, nah, you're crazy. A volleyball show? have Like, balancing it out with school, balancing it out with my outside life, balancing, without, balancing it out with work and whatnot, and family life and everything else. I don't think I would have believed you if you said this show, Set Point, is going to have 100 episodes. Abs- but look at where we're at now. It's absolutely amazing. And I've had so many guests, and I really want to make Set Point a big thing. And I don't know how long Set Point is going to continue to keep going strong, but I'll also say this that. I couldn't have done it without the help of not only Larry B, but all my comrades at IE Sports Radio. I know volleyball is a little, what's the word, foreign to them. But I'll also say this, like, it's a very unique sport and a fun sport at that. Just because I don't think it gets a whole lot of love. And it's one of the fastest growing sports when it comes to, like, youth sports. Like, like in high school, like, in club volleyball. The list goes on and on. So, all in all, here for me learning how to keep on doing set point, it's just great. And this year was kind of, what's the word, all over the place. Like, let's take it back to the fall of 2020, where we don't know if volleyball was going to happen. I eventually found out that there was going to be some fall volleyball. Unfortunately, not a whole lot of fall volleyball. It was just part SEC, part ACC then the Sun Belt Conference just completed their whole conference schedule, and then the Big 12 completed its conference schedule for the most part. And then you got to see a few other volleyball teams play in the place of non-conference action, which was kind of cool, if you ask me. So my thing is for set point is... I was able to just keep the ball rolling. I don't know how I was able to do it, even though there were days where I didn't know what to have material on. But I just made it work. And then I eventually discovered the NVA, and which is the National Volleyball Associate, Association. I was like, whoa, I didn't even know this was a thing. And they had like a mini event in like November of 2020, which was really cool. And then they've event- they've eventually grown, and you know obviously the NBA isn't as big as the NBA or the NFL or any of those other pro sports leagues, but the NBA is quite unique. And I also didn't know about another pro sports league. I forget the name, but it's the organization that Emily Eamon and Peyton Chang work at. It's called AP something. It's it's AU something. It's like Athletes Unlimited. That's the thing. So Athletes Unlimited was the organization that had like that had like pro volleyball for like women. It's eventually going to have pro volleyball for men. So it's going to be a split decision for the NBA and 
Athletes Unlimited. But I think it's going to be a good split decision because it's going to grow more pro volleyball once everything is done. And I'm excited for more pro volleyball because volleyball as a whole should not just be a high school, well, a junior high school or a youth or high school and college experience. It should be for pros. And obviously, if you want to play pro, you got to go international. But now you can play pro in the good old U.S. And the NBA has teams not just located in California with Orange County, Los Angeles, and Ontario, but there's there's a team located in Vegas, there's a team located in Dallas, a team located in Texas, which I don't know exactly where it's located at, but they do have a team in Texas called the Texas Tyrants. I think they originally were the... They were in Tennessee, I want to say, and then they flocked over to Texas. I'm not entirely sure. Don't quote me on that. Anyway, and then there's also Southern Exposure, which I guess is all South Volleyball, which is located in Orlando. And then there's a team called Team Freedom, which is located in East New Jersey. So that was something I did not know about when it came to the NVA. So that was really cool. Um... Fast forward to 2021, I found out that every volleyball conference was having a season except for the Big Con- Big West Conference and the Ivy League. Now, the Big West Conference not having a v- women's volleyball season really hit home for me because, number one, it was my last year at Long Beach State. Number two, it's like that's my school and not having a not even allowing the conference teams to like have a season, not even like play non-league games or non-conference games, really was a bummer. It's like, wow, really? It's like you're not even going to give the the teams a chance to play in a in some non-conference games or at least allow them to like flock to another league. It's like, come on, now. Regardless, we had other teams playing in other conferences, like the Power 5 conferences, like the Pac-12, the SCC, which had its full season. We also had the Big Ten that finally got to have their season, and then the rest of the ACC, and then every other conference, like the West Coast Conference, the Sun Belt Conference already had its season, Um, the Western Athletic Conference or the WAC, the Mountain West Conference. I'm saying all these West Coast conferences. Why don't? Why am I saying that? I don't know. But the the point is, is that I was a, the AAC. That's another conference I forgot to mention. But the point is, is that we all got to have volleyball again. At first, it was a little quiet and dull because there were no fans. Like some arenas didn't have fans at their gymnasium. Some did which was cool, but others didn't, which was sad face. Say la vie, however. For California, no one could really go to games, which really stunk. And then when certain teams in certain conferences had to, like, postpone games, they had to outright cancel them. Like, the Pac-12 was the worst of the worst. Like, the Pac-12 had to, like, Every time a team was unable to play, they had to cancel that series and basically make it a just a canceled series, which means... And the worst part about the Pac-12 was that they just couldn't allow teams to, like, schedule other teams. Like, the Pac-12 couldn't go outside of their conference to, like, schedule... They couldn't even schedule non-conference games against Pac-12 teams, which really stunk. But, back to me, when it came to set point doing volleyball in the spring of 2021, there was a lot of volleyball going on. There was NCAA women's volleyball happening. Eventually, NCAA men's volleyball jumped into the fray. And then NCAA beach volleyball entered the chat. And then also in in March, I yeah, I think it was March, we had... We had the NVA starting up, which was, it was a lot of volleyball happening. I unfortunately couldn't cover everything. Like, I had to cover some of the noteworthy matchups, and I unfortunately didn't cover the NVA to start until after the NCAA women's volleyball and men's volleyball tournament, and then eventually after the NCAA beach volleyball tournament, the NVA had my outright attention. So, there was that right there, and... 
eventually, I got to do the cover the NVA. Well, not cover it, but recap it through here. So, but after the NVA, there was no volleyball happening. And I'm like, and even when the NVA had its like breaks where it prepared for the playoffs, I had to think, what am I going to do when it comes to, when it comes to set point? I don't want to like post, I don't want to like take the week off. So eventually I had to think of my own little things. I eventually thought of like schedule releases that the NCAA women's volleyball teams had released. I also had to think of the whole, I actually eventually found this Twitter account, Twitter and Instagram account called College Volleyball Transfers, where it kept track of all the volleyball players in the NCAA Division One volleyball scene, where it talked about where they're transferring and whatnot, and where they were heading to if they chose to transfer. So there's that. There was that right there. So basically, I. Ha- have a little segment on the show called the transfer portal news. And then there's also other NCAA volleyball news. And then in the latter part of this traditional show at the moment, we have the schedule releases for all the NCAA women's volleyball teams. Like, I don't know if we'll be, I'll probably be cutting down on some of the schedule releases and maybe like making note of like the noteworthy schedule releases, like, say Kentucky or Stanford, which I already did, and then USC, which I already did, and the list goes on and on. So overall, I'm still trying to find ways to keep set point going, and I'm doing a pretty good job of it, if I do say so myself. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but I will also say this. It's not easy to like keep the show going. As I said earlier... One of our iSports radio colleagues said, it's not easy to do a show by yourself. And it's tough to really find, in my opinion, volleyball fans. Like, passionate volleyball fans. Especially since, other than California, like, there's not really, like, a state where it's like, oh, God, oh, cool, volleyball is on. I can't wait to watch this. So, yeah, it was... and fun fact about the show, the show actually had a co-host at the time. It was Jack Stafford, but eventually he moved on because of work and whatnot. And it was great to have him on a couple episodes. And the fun fact about that was I actually was planning to have his older brother Sam on the show. And then let's just say the set point aired on a Tuesday, which was the day of blackout Tuesday, which was not a good idea. I eventually got a call from Sam, and he said, I don't think it's a good idea for me to be on a podcast, but what about my brother Jack? And it's like, that might not be a bad idea. And I eventually reached him, and I was able to find him and tell him, hey, Jack, you want to be on set point? And he's like, sure. And then he eventually wanted to be a co-host, and my only regret was I wish we had a set, like, schedule for the both of us. I understand he and I both worked. Like, at the time he was working this past summer, I was working this past summer at the grocery store just because I needed to make income. So, so I the only my only regret of having him on the show was I wish I could have had our schedules coincide with one another. Problem is, for my job, is that it's tough to, like, ask for days off in the summer. Like, you have to have a legit excuse. You can't just say, oh, I want this day off. Give it to me. Like, they're going to ask you, why do you want this day off? And if you do it too consistently of asking for a day off, they're basically going to get annoyed. So I basically, and luckily, was able to get, like, morning shifts, which eventually didn't work out for Jack because he worked in the evenings or afternoons. But it is what it was, and I still loved having Jack as a guest, and it was great. I see him every so often working with the little kids and whatnot, so all in all, for my journey with Set Point, it's been a fantastic journey from episode one on on, uh, September 30th all the way to july 26th it's been a great ride and the fact that i made it to 100 episodes in the span of less than two years is also kind of impressive and it's still a miracle to this day i don't even know how but i don't know how set point continues to go on weekly week after week because eventually everyone needs a break from the from the madness and 
eventually, and but my thing was is that I gotta keep the show rolling, which was kind of a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing was it it's great to keep the show going, to keep a show going, but you sometimes will get burnt out, or you'll sometimes run low on material to the point where you can't talk about, and you either have to make your show a short show, or you just gotta take the week off and just prepare for next week and see what happens. Like, for me, my goal for Set Point is to keep it going year-round, because you got NCAA Women's Volleyball in the fall. Then after that, you have NCAA Men's Volleyball in the winter. And then later on in the spring, you have NCAA Beach Volleyball in the spring, and then with the NVA, it still has the NVA that day as well. Or it, it goes on the spring as well, which hopefully, knock on wood, it still stays the same. Hopefully it still goes on in the uh, spring. And then after NCAA men's volleyball and NCAA beach volleyball season, you have the NVA playoffs in the, in the uh, summer, which, if, heaven forbid, if it keeps on going, then then the NVA will still, like, have this format. And I hope it does have the regular season in the spring work its way up to the fall, or not the fall, the uh, summer, and then just end it right there. And then, obviously, with the summer, we have the Olympics going on, and then we also have pro volleyball happening, like, in the Volleyball Nations League, a.k.a. the VNL. And then also, in the summer, we have the AVP happening. Like, the AVP is going to be here in the late in like mid to like late august uh, well no early september mid august is when the avp is going to be happening so that's more volleyball i need to talk about and eventually the cycle is going to start all back up on august 27th which is the first day of official women's volleyball matches so that's when season number three of set point is going to begin and heaven knows if i'll be using Streamyard for that like if i do plan to use Streamyard. I'll try to use StreamYard. Like, fun fact, when I used StreamYard for the season debut of ep- of Season 2 of Set Point, it wasn't really easy. I kind of had to, like, figure out where I was going to do the show, and it's like, maybe I should do it in my room. No, background is bad. Maybe I should do it downstairs. Nope, my brother's pretty much working. So then I basically went up to my brother's room, and it's like, can I just do it in here? And I eventually learned that no matter where I do the show when it comes to, like, video, the lighting is pretty much going to be bad. So, eventually, I'm going to need to, like, buy a, like, backlight or maybe, like, a backdrop or a green screen. And then, eventually, maybe make my show on available with me being face-to-face, which, that would be awesome. And another thing I need to mention, I'll, I promise you all I'll be wrapping this up shortly because we need to bring on our our last and final guest, the last thing I need to t- tell you all about is I eventually had to buy a headset mic because my built-in mic on my laptop kind of crapped out. Like, it was still working at the time, but it just didn't give it the cr- the uh, quality for all my shows, which really was a bummer. And I eventually had to get used to having a headset mic, and it was cool and all. It was really cool. So this whole this headset mic has kind of been my baby and it was well worth the $43 I bought off of Adorama which has your need for all electronics Adorama please sponsor us <clears throat> uh, but honestly to wrap up on the story time with Taryn on set point it's been a fun ride and I hope to continue to keep set point going from now until the day where I gotta say this is match point so and hopefully it doesn't come too soon, but the future can pretty much be anything at this point. So we'll see how it goes, but I'm very honored, not just for for iSports Radio, because I don't know too many other shows here that have crossed the 100-episode thresh mark. Like, I'm pretty sure we've had plenty of episodes that have crossed 100 episodes, like Defining Moment, The Extra Mile. I want to say 3 and Out has crossed... Uh, the 100 episode mark. I'm almost certain it has because it's been on for like what seven years. I want to say. Help me out, Larry B. Um, ahem. but there was, like I said, defining moments crossed 100 episodes. Extra Mile has crossed up 100 episodes. 
Three and Out has crossed 100 episodes. I think maybe Bases Loaded has crossed 100 episodes. I'm not entirely sure, just because I joined Bases Loaded during their first season, which was all the way back in 2019, back when there wasn't a pandemic. <clears throat> um, Unfiltered Truth, back when it was here, just reached 100 episodes, but it's kind of not with IE Sports Radio, so... But the fact that I am one of few shows that have been that have crossed 100 episodes is very honoring. I couldn't have done it without Larry B, for starters. I also couldn't have done it without you, the listeners. Like, if you did anything possible, and to anyone that has made my sh- that has either promoted my show, that has been a guest on my show, that's listened to my show, that's offered me feedback of the show, that's told me, your show is pretty cool, man. I don't think I could ever talk volleyball. Or anything among the show, however you impacted it, whether it was for good or for worse or whatever, I appreciate you. Like, I really do appreciate you, the people, who have helped made this show an amazing show. And I know I'm not the greatest volleyball person in the world. I'm not the biggest volleyball fanatic. Like, sometimes I even stumble my words and I have to recheck everything. But the fact that I, you have made me a better podcaster, a better host when it comes to this show, the fact that this show has continued to go despite the pandemic, despite having to run into walls, despite me having to hit my... my what, low points or brick walls. It's just amazing. And I couldn't have done this without all of your help. And I really do appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. Like, if I had a, a list, I think I this story time with Taryn would be going a lot longer than expected. But that's going to do it for the segment of story time with Taryn. Once again, thank you all for supporting set point to this point but we're not done yet when it comes to this episode we have one more guest coming on his name is jimmy garcia he is a play-by-play announcer for for stanford athletics he is on kzsu 90.1 fm and like i said he is a sports caster for stanford sports so I'm going to be talking to him in a little bit. But you are listening to Set Point, the 100th episode, here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. We'll be right back after a word from these drops. college football and do you want to hear a college football show dedicated to all this college football including junior college and the triple ccaa and the njcaa the naia and the ncaa including division three division two division one double a in the fcs and division one single a in the fbs well then look no further join myself larry b and my colleagues, Mr. H-Town Blake, Blake Henley, and Mr. Christian Espinoza, each week during the college football season for the latest in college football on Three and Out College Edition, right here on IE Sports Radio, your directory for all that is sports. guys, it's Blake Henley, better known as H-Town Blake to some of you. Happy to announce that Faces Loader is back in full force. We'll be bringing that high heat every Tuesday night here on IE Sports Radio. So come home, get ready, dig into that batter's box, and see if you can chase that high heat, baby. So we'll be coming to you live with all the stats, all the rundowns, all the division rivalries, and every team that's going to make the playoff push to get to that one and only October and get to the pinnacle of what baseball is to hoist that commissioner's trophy when it's all said and done.
and welcome back to the 100th episode of Set Point. Thank you so much for tuning in and for being here on this pretty much second hour. So without any further delay, let's get on into our final guest of this 100th episode. My guest is a sportscaster for Stanford, as he does play-by-play announcing, and he does a top-notch job. He is a Stanford sports play-by-play sportscaster for KZSU 90.1 FM, and he is very good at his job. He's called lots of memorable Stanford games, and he's called the national championship with Stanford women's volleyball. Ladies and gentlemen, welcoming in our last guest of the night, Mr. Jimmy Garcia. Jimmy, how you doing, buddy? I am doing great. How are you doing? Doing awesome, and I am glad to ha- meet you, and I am also glad you reached out to being a guest on Set Point. It really means a lot, so it's great to, ha- to have you on the show, and I'm excited to have you on. I am so excited to be on. I've been uh, looking forward to this for quite a, quite a while now, and I'm super happy to be on. Mm-hmm, me too. So without any further delay, let's get on into this little interview with Mr. Jimmy Garcia. But first, just as a disclaimer, these are the thoughts and opinions of myself, Taryn Rodriguez, and Jimmy Garcia, and not the thoughts and opinions of IE Sports Radio, KZSU 90.1 FM, Stanford University, Long Beach State, the list goes on and on. Just got to get that little disclaimer out the way. So, Jimmy, the floor is all yours, my man. Tell everyone who you are, what you do, and basically how long you've been broadcasting for. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm Jimmy Garcia. I'm 22 years old, and uh, I have been broadcasting at Stanford for six years, the last six years of my life. I started there when I was uh, 16 years old, believe it or not, um, I got in my junior year of high school uh, knowing a DJ at the radio station, actually. And uh, he had a contact with our sports director at the time and offered to maybe put me in contact. And I, at that time, had kind of wrapped up my playing career and just jumped at the idea to continue in sports and to continue broadcasting. And it really just was a whole new horizon for me once it came on. A whole list of things that I never imagined I'd be able to do, games I would call, people I would meet, and just the stories I'd be able to tell. And so my life since that day, since I made that decision to go ahead and apply, has completely changed my life. That's great stuff, man. And that's really awesome that you've known how to do this, or that you've wanted to be a broadcaster for a while. So honestly, like... What have been some of your more memorable calls, and which games do you think have been some of your best games that you've called? Wow. So the most memorable games, I mean, um, I I did, I I had the privilege of covering the last three of the Stanford Women's Volleyball National Championship games, and so all of those games will forever have a super special place um, in my heart. Um, In 2016, um, that year will always stick out to me. I will never forget going to the stadium that day um, when Stanford played the Texas Longhorns. That game will forever stick out in my mind. Um, I sat down at on um, press row there, courtside, and I'll never forget, like, five minutes before first serve, the left half of my body kind of just went numb, and I was just shocked by the moment. It just felt incredible to be there, to be surrounded by 20,000 fans screaming and cheering their teams on. And then going forward and watching some of the highest level volleyball I've ever seen. Um, And then to follow that up, then the game in 2018, I think for me, it was probably the most special of those three that I had the the privilege of calling. Um, Getting to play against a team like Nebraska, a player like Michaela Fecky, who is just so well known around Nebraska as being one of the greatest ever there. And for her to finish that game, she had her career high in kills that night. And so to see her kind of give Stanford the virtuoso for five sets and really just give it her all, to watch a performance like that in a game like that, it was just incredible. And to see all the fans there, obviously Stanford and Nebraska both wearing red. So when you watch that game and they, they, they pan out to the crowd, I mean, it's just a sea of red everywhere. And it was definitely a heavily uh, Nebraska-favored crowd. And I remember my color commentator a few times 
Um, after Nebraska will come up with a big stuff block, they do this chant, roof, roof, roof. And my partner at the time, King Jemison, looks over at me on the broadcast, and he just says three words. He said, that was spine chilling. You could just feel the momentum. You could feel the electricity at the table in the arena, and that game will forever st- I mean, going five sets in a championship is always just something special. But to do it in front of a crowd like that and, and an atmosphere like that, um, just thinking about it gets me get the goosebumps on my arms. And I do see that uh, little like broadcast of that that final point where Megan McClure put down the match clinching kill for the NCAA championship against Nebraska. It is a work of art, man. Like if you're not following Jimmy Garcia on Twitter and you don't see that, then you are missing out. And again, you do such a fantastic job. Like to me, who influences you when it comes to broadcasting because as an up-and-coming broadcaster myself i want to know the tricks in the trade yeah i mean growing up in the bay area i I felt like i had a lot of great influences from people that i listened to here um i'm a huge giants fan so Dwayne kuiper and uh mike kruko are just like my it forever have a special place in my heart um and there's a video of Dwayne kuiper calling barry bond's the 756th home run, the one that broke the all-time record. And the video is a side-by-side of the stadium and then of him in the booth. And he's calling this, uh, you know, this home run, and he's just sitting there in the booth so calm and collected. And it really stood out to me that you can have as much fun as you want while also staying professional and keeping the whole thing in check, the whole call, the whole game, keeping the listener engaged throughout while you're also kind of losing your mind at what you just witnessed. Um, nationally, I feel like I try and take a lot of influence from different broadcasters. Uh, one of my favorites is who used to cover the NCAA tournament a lot was Beth Mullins. Um, mm-hmm. Beth has one of these, this incredible ability to balance out enthusiasm with professionalism and also just catering to the listener. You're always getting new information. You're always learning while you're listening to the game. And I feel like that's so important Um, as a broadcaster, is to really make sure we're getting through to the listeners the information that they want to hear and in a way that comes across that everyone can interpret really well. It's funny you should mention the San Francisco Giants. We have a San Francisco Giants slash Northern California sports fan as well as the host of iSports Radio's Northern California Sports Show in the chat room, Gina G, who is a diehard diehard. Northern California sports fan and Giants fan, so that's kind of got to throw that out there. So, <laughs> so as for KZSU nine ninety point one FM, how did you hear about them, and what was it like applying for them, and how did they reach out to you? Yeah, so I had I kind of did the initial process of reaching out to them, asking if there were any openings, asking if there was a way to get involved. Um. And really just kind of putting myself out there. And at that time, I really was not that person that was as outgoing as I am now. I was a little bit more reserved, a little bit more shy. I had issues kind of speaking up for myself and, and being open and honest about what I wanted to do, how I wanted to, you know, participate. And when it came to, you know, talking with the people at Stanford at the time at the radio station, it just felt very natural to me. And that's kind of how I knew that I was doing the right thing. It felt very right. Um, And they reached out not too long after that, the sports director at the time, Nikki Sullivan, and he said, why don't you come on up and we'll, we'll show you around the place a little bit and see what you think. And so I went up um, and kind of toured the, the, the station and got a feel for it. And then a few weeks later, they put me through a training program. And after that, I was, I was good to go on air a few weeks after that. Um, so the process kind of happened quickly, but it was just so much about taking the opportunity when it presented itself. Um, the door was open for, you know, just a sliver of a moment and I made sure to jump right through it. And looking back on it, I would do it a hundred times over. Awesome stuff. So do you happen to have like a commentating part partner or play by play person or not play by play uh col- yeah color commentary person who like just aids you or do you kind of fly solo 
Yeah, so uh, a little bit of both, actually. So a lot of road games will do solo at times. Um, a lot of home games were always paired up. Um, I had the privilege of calling a lot of games with uh, one man in particular, King Jemison, for the last couple of years um, with covering Stanford women's volleyball specifically. Um, and it was so awesome. You know, the longer we worked together, just the chemistry on air that we had was just so unique and so genuine. Um, and that's, that's how you know the magic's happening, right? When I stop talking, he knows when to cut in and vice versa. And by the end, by one of our last games, I mean, it just, it was just perfect the way it was rolling out there for us. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. So when it comes to doing road games, like how unique is it to do road games? And what has been your favorite place to travel when doing certain road games? Wow. So I, I have got to cover a lot of road games. Um, I, I like to separate the Pac-12 versus everyone else because I've gotten to travel quite a bit through the conference. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with in the Pac-12, my favorite place to go is usually up to Washington. I, I love the Seattle area. So it's a great place when you're in the town to kind of get out and visit if you can, if you've got some downtime. The scenery is beautiful. The people are awesome. Um, and I really I think it's one of my favorites to go to and the, and the environment up in Washington is a lot of fun. They really do a good job up there. And I think it's the Alaska airlines arena and they do a pretty good job of getting a lot of fans in the arena. And the team has been so good the last 10, 15 years that they have no issue getting fans in the arena. Um, so the atmosphere is great, but calling the road games can be a little interesting sometimes because you get to the arena, you set up all your equipment and then you're kind of just, I'm not hoping, but you're, you're checking all the boxes of everything that has to happen before you go on air. Um, and there are times you get to the arena and things don't go right, you know, and, and that's part of, that's part of it. And that's the hard part is that, you know, you don't know what those questions are going to be when, that you're going to have when you're on the road. They're just going to come as situations arise. Um, but I think something that was helped me out a lot was always going early. You have to be there early because if stuff is going to go wrong, it's better to have time to try and fix it than to be there getting there an hour before, 45 minutes beforehand, realizing there's an issue and then not having any time to solve it. So one of the main things I always focused on was getting to the arena as early as they'd let me in, getting set up, making sure the equipment was always working properly. Um, because that's something people don't also don't really realize is there are times you go to different venues and their internet or their ethernet lines that they've provided for you are just not going to connect back to where you want it to connect to. And you find yourself in a situation like that, and you have to figure out how you're going to then navigate that situation, how you're going to produce a broadcast, or if you are going to produce a live broadcast, how you're going to do that. There are times that we've been in in stadiums, and and there was just no way to connect. It just wasn't going to happen. And in situations like that, we also have the ability to record the broadcast, uh, save the broadcast, and then send it to our station, and then they're able to actually play it at a later time that evening. So it's almost always, you know, going on the road is a lot of fun, but it can also be challenging. Um, obviously, the, the hardest part sometimes is just traveling, getting on flights, going through airports, making sure you have all your equipment with you. Um, we always try to take our equipment, you know, on board with us. We try to keep it with us. I think that's a good practice just because you don't want to lose that stuff. It's really expensive. It's hard to replace, and it's not fun to replace it either. Um and so just kind of navigating all through that, it, it, it can be a bit more challenging than people realize. You know, you're going through TSA with a large, you know, Pelican case with a, you know, huge square at the bottom and you get, you, people look at you a little bit differently and they usually stop you through TSA. They have to take your bag out almost every time. Um, and those are just little things people don't always realize is that it's a longer process when you're traveling with road equipment. Um, and it's not just the easiest thing in the world. Um, but you also mentioned like one of my favorite venues to go to, um, two years ago, the, the women's volleyball team did play kind of a, a large road trip, if you will. We played at Penn state and then at Nebraska in the same week, had games against Penn state, Minnesota, and then at Nebraska mm. and witnessing a Penn state whiteout in person was like just a chef's kick. It was just perfect. I mean, the, the, the crowd, the feeling. Um, the, the towels, you know, just seeing it live is just so unique. And then about five days later, we're in Lincoln, Nebraska to go to the Bob Devaney Sports Center. And, you know, that consecutive sellout streak is just incredible. And I believe the game that Stanford played in is the current record holder 
for tickets sold at the Bob Devaney Sports Center. And at the time, it broke the record for the most watched game on Big Ten Network. So it was a huge game. It was a one versus two to start the 2019 season a couple weeks in. And so going to see a game at Nebraska, there's really nothing like it. They say there's nothing like Nebraska. And when you go and see it in person, there really isn't. I mean, the atmosphere, the crowd, the stadium, the arena, it's just, it just checks every box. And so I would recommend any fan that can make it out to a game there absolutely does if they can. Absolutely amazing. And even our Northern California sports host of iSports Radio said it best. Wow. That's pretty much all you could say. So when COVID hit the whole world, what was that feeling like when it came to not having sports and just not being able to do what you love? I mean, that that is a really, really great question. You know, COVID hit me a little bit more hit me harder than I think a lot of people. Um, I'm severely immunocompromised. I've had a lot of underlying health conditions my whole life. And so mm-hmm. it was really difficult navigating, trying to find my way back to the broadcasting booth. Um, it was something that had to come with the approval of my medical care team. Um, and so there was a while where we were learning to navigate calling games remotely, um, how that would work. Um, also doing things kind of all remotely um, at the station, not just with broadcasting, but with the shows that we had running throughout the days as well. So there were just a lot of little things that we had to learn to navigate um, through that time period. And we're still navigating it. You know, we're still in the pandemic. We're still not out of it yet. And I think we've done a really good job of kind of revamping everything so meant to make things a little bit more user-friendly for everyone. Um, and I think that actually a lot of the, things we implemented throughout the pandemic are things that we'll continue to use even after um, being able to, to do things more remotely. is just a, very helpful for a lot of people. If they can't make it into the station for whatever reason, they have the ability to kind of run things from wherever they're at. Um, and so it's kind of a game changer for a lot of us at the station, being able to do so much away from the station while still also having a big impact on the ongoings of its day-to-day operation. Yeah, it was very tough just not having sports in this world. Like, I even think that I remember that, like, a broadcasting team had to, like, do throwbacks of, like, certain games from, like, the NCAA tournament in, like, certain years, like, 94 and whatnot. So, that's just how tough COVID was. So, do you happen to have any advice for those that have to broadcast games remotely by chance? Yeah, I think that. One is it's hard not to take your eyes off the TV because it's easy to miss something and then you come back and it's on a replay, but you realize you're calling something that's a replay when it comes back live. Um, and then also just being comfortable. I think it's a different environment. I think sometimes it's easier being at home. You don't have as much going on. You, but also at the same time, that can be a distraction. You are in your home. You have a lot of things that could distract you there as well. So just trying to remain focused on what's going on and what's on the screen can be a really tough, but it's also probably the most important thing possible. Um, and like I tell everyone, I think just being yourself, no matter whether you're in person or you're remote, just being yourself will be, will be, will be the biggest key. You know, I, I think people sometimes try and get away from who they are to be a voice that they want to be versus just being the voice that they are and embracing that. And I think that's what's so important is just be yourself. And then everything just comes natural when you're yourself. Great advice, and honestly, again, as a up and coming broadcaster, like I don't know if broadcasting is going to be my future, but as an on the rise broadcaster, I need all the advice I can get. <laughs> so I appreciate you doing that and uh, giving giving not just me myself, but everyone at home and all the other broadcasters some advice. So, all right, so you do you obviously do volleyball. When it comes when it comes to like play by play and broadcasting, but what other sports at Stanford do you do, and who have been some noteworthy people you've met in Stanford sports history? Yeah, so I when I first started off, um, I've been at the station for I believe six years, and I did five years covering Stanford women's volleyball. Um, that was my main fall sport that I did for the last four or five years. And then when the spring rolled around, I did a lot of Stanford baseball. So I would travel with them as well and cover them. 
um, at home and on the road. Um, helped out a little bit with some of our football halftime shows when needed um, during football season. And then also in the uh, winter, doing a little bit of men's and women's basketball as well. So just kind of trying to touch all those bases as well. All right, awesome. And that's definitely unique right there. You got to you can't just specialize in one sport. You gotta like have your bases loaded, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, no, I, I think I think you're you're totally right. I think it's just it's just really good to be able to do to be very versatile when you're a broadcaster. You know, you need to be able to call different sports, um, and and you know, certain sports help prepare you more for other sports. You know, you know, calling uh, volleyball and baseball, they're very. Um, there's sports that are just, there's not a lot in common. You have volleyball where the pace of play is very fast. You have touches happening constantly. In baseball, you're sitting down for three and a half, four hours sometimes, and you've got all this time to fill. You know, so what, what story are you telling for each game, for each broadcast, for each sport? Um, the storylines are so different, but they're also so similar in the sense that you have the ability to really drive it in any way that you want. You know, and I think that's the special part about it is that going into the game that day, you know, what story do I want to tell today? What story are we telling, you know? And then looking at that and then trying to figure out the approach to tell that story that you want to, you know? Um, and that's the neat thing about calling so many different sports is that you have so many different storylines constantly happening, whether it's an injury, whether it's a win streak going on, whether it's a team coming in that's, you know, number one in the country, whether – the team coming in has, you know, won the most games in a row in the conference the last two weeks. You know, there's always something new, even when you're in a three-game baseball series against the same team on the third day on the road, you know. There's always something new developing and that's going on. So always being willing and learning and looking out for those things because they do pop up, and you always want to be able to snag them because it can always be a new storyline to tell in one of those broadcasts. Great stuff. So when you can't, when you also uh, talk, when you also talked a little about baseball, um, we actually got a comment here saying Brandon Beck is going to be awesome in the MLB. Have you met Brandon Beck? And if so, what's he like as a baseball player outside of baseball? Yeah. So I actually not only have I met Brandon, but I actually met his older brother Tristan. I was actually uh, on the call for Tristan's opening day game. Uh, five, six years ago, I believe, in 2016 when he made his debut as a freshman starter for Stanford. It was very rare that you'll see a, a freshman starting on the mound um, and then getting to know Brendan a little bit um, on the road and whatnot. I mean, I think you're looking at a really, really talented young pitcher in Brendan Beck. I mean, he's a guy that when you talk to him, you just get the feeling that he understands baseball. He wants to win a lot. Um, he approaches every game with this just laser focus. Um, when he goes out there, and this is something that he, I also noticed a lot with his brother, Tristan, is that when they get the ball on the mound, they have this look in their eye. They're ready to go as soon as the batter steps in. There's no hesitating. There's no questioning what pitch was called. They are ready to rock as soon as that batter steps into the box. And to watch them work in person and to see that tempo – getting the ball ready to go, getting the ball ready to go. And also seeing the confidence he has in himself to pick his spots, his locations, and the way he mixes speeds. That's the thing about Brendan that's really interesting. And Tristan as well had this as well. They have a really, really good curveball. He throws a really nasty 12-6. It's so good he throws it sometimes really early in the count. Sometimes he'll start hitters with it on the first pitch. Um, and so just to see him work live, you really see his full tool bag on display and his ability to hit his spots is unlike anyone I've seen in a long time, especially at Stanford. Um, you know, his ability to, to, you know, he'll go breaking ball, breaking ball, get the guy, you know, off his feet a little bit. And then he pounds a high fastball and the guy's just not ready for it. Um, he's just so aware of the situation of the moment. Um, and that's why I think it was honestly especially hard for him with the way the season ended against Vanderbilt. I'm, I don't think I'm ready to talk about that quite yet. Um, that was a heartbreaking <laughs> loss. But um, I think it was really hard for Brendan to be on the mound there because he was ready to, you know, put put the team on his back and, and give him one more game of all he had, you know. 
And I think if you asked him every time over, he would ask to have the ball again in that situation. You know, and I think if you were to ask David Esker, the head coach, he would say the same thing. That there's no one else you want in that moment. Even if you've got the best closer, you want to go to a guy you can believe in and you can trust in. And Brendan has been that guy for the last few seasons. And so when, when Esker went out there and brought in Brendan, I don't think anyone had any doubt that he was going to finish the game, no matter if it ended in the eighth or ended in the ninth inning or if they continued to play on. He was going to stay out there until the final out was recorded one way or another. And so I, I think he's going to be a star at the next level. I think like most my, you know, most guys who are going into the minor leagues, it's going to take time to develop, but I definitely see him, you know, scratching the surface and making an impact on a big league club one day. Yeah, that was, that was definitely a rough ending to his college baseball season. But honestly, I totally agree with the comment in the chat room from Gina G. She, she says, she, uh, she obviously said that, Brandon Beck is going to be an awesome. Is going to be awesome in the NBLB. I think he's definitely going to make a tremendous impact, and I can't wait to see what he can do. So, steering away from Stanford a little bit. So, when it comes to hearing, when it comes to like other teams as like uh, play-by-play sportscasters for like say Cal, maybe USC. Have you met any of those, or have you met any of those other play-by-play sportscasters? And if so, what what's that? been like oh my gosh yeah i i think it's so important when you're on the road to try and make that connection with the opposing team's broadcaster you say opposing team but when you're broadcasting we're kind of all on the same team you know we're we're calling for two different teams but realistically we're all working in that same industry where we're trying to you know be better for each other um i've met a lot of really good broadcasters across the years and i had the chance to meet some of them some of them i've just met over social media and that's been a great way to connect as well um i I think it's awesome because i think you can message each other and you have the ability to really just learn from each other um there's a guy who works for purdue university his name is daniel gilman he does their play-by-play for volleyball and he has been a big influence of mine the last couple of years he does an incredible job covering the team um, and he's always willing to provide me feedback. He's always asking me if I have any feedback for him. Um, and it, we've kind of just got this relationship now where we can talk to each other about sports, about broadcasting, and we can kind of roll off of each other about, you know, our thoughts on both of it and give each other feedback, which is really helpful, I think. I think constructive criticism is so important in this, um, especially in broadcasting. Constructive criticism is key. I think it's hard sometimes for us as broadcasters, they fear that maybe people don't like what we have to say or they didn't like a certain take that we had. But I think at the same time, too, not having those takes don't always allow you to grow as a broadcaster. I think sometimes you have to hear that people aren't always happy with their product and that you have to know that you have to get better. Um, and that's also important because there is a learning curve for some people. You know, there's a moment of comfortable uh, comfortability that comes, you know, where you no longer are worried about going on air and you're, you're just looking ready, you know, you're looking forward to putting on the headset and just kind of getting after it, you know. Um, and so I think just being able to communicate with other broadcasters, building those relationships and those friendships really help to go a long way. Um, something I always tell people in the industry is that your relationships today can become your references tomorrow. Um And what I mean by that is that you can build relationships with people that you can really get to know and that can become really key pieces for you going forward and with whatever you do. Um, And so it's really important with whether you're talking with the opposing team's broadcasters or even like their SIDs, the sports information directors, really being on a good note with all of them will get you so much farther. Um, It's just super important to build those relationships, whether it's the broadcasters or even just the people working with the team. Great, awesome advice and awesome story right there. So I actually know someone that works with sports media. His name is Mark Willard, and he is the host of KNBR. And I actually met him through the broadcaster's path. And I've actually listened to him ever since his days with ESPN LA. So do you happen to know who Mark Willard is? And if so, like, what do you like about Mark Willard? Yeah, I, I mean, I know Mark just from his show mainly on KNBR. I, I don't know him personally or anything like that, but 
you know, something you get when you listen to Mark Willard is you get authenticity. You don't get anything that's not him. And I think that is something that I really like about listening to his show is that you're going to get exactly who Mark Willard is throughout the show. You're going to get a lot of honest opinions. You're going to get a lot of honest takes. And you're going to also get a lot of reasoning behind that. And that's what I think he does really well is, like we were almost all taught in school, right? You have a, you provide an example and then you have to provide reasoning behind that, you know? And I think that's something sometimes we can forget in the industry is that sometimes you just have to simplify it. You can have a hot take or a cake, if you will, but you really have to be able to back up what you're saying. And I think Mark does a good job of providing his thoughts, but then also providing why he's feeling that way as well, which is really important. Oh, yeah, and like I said, I've listened to him ever since he was back with ESPN LA, and eventually he had to move up north, and he has just been a definite asset to me. When I had the whole little broadcaster's path like session with like other people, I enjoyed listening to his advice, and then I enjoyed meeting the other people at the broadcaster's path, and I just enjoyed hearing his story and whatnot, and I'm happy to have met happy to have met him via Zoom. I would have liked to have met him in person, but I can't complain. So anyway, let's switch gears a little bit as let's talk some pop culture when it comes to like Northern California. So when it comes to you, what are some good places to eat in Northern California? Because I've actually I'm actually a Southern California guy but I would like to know, in case I plan to go up, up north, I'd like to know if there's any, like, go-to spots in Northern California. Oh, man. You know, there, there there's a lot of go-to places. Um, I'm not always the great, the, the best guy to ask. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking to one of the pickiest eaters in Northern California <laughs> here. So maybe not the best guy to give out advice here, but, you know, there are some really, really good little restaurants right by the Stanford campus, and uh, there's this place called Gott's Roadside, um, and they prov- they have just amazing, it's kind of American-style food, um, just really yummy. I think w- if you're ever up here, the, the, the thing that is so special is that there's such a, a big influence from so many different cultures here that in a five-minute, uh, you know, period, you can find just about any style of food that you would like. And I think that's what's really neat out here is that anywhere you go, you can get food from so many different cultures and so many different flavors all in a one block radius. Sometimes you know, you just have so many different um, cultures in the Bay area. It's a very diverse area, which is a big reason I like it here. There's so many different walks of life and different people to meet and different stories to hear from different people. Um, So I think when you're up here, I think you can't go wrong just about trying anything because there's so many great places up here. Ah, see, see, I'm also a picky eater myself. Like I will take anything, whether it's like, like pizza or burgers or Mexican food or anything like that. I'm, I'm a fan of like pretty much all food. So that's kind of the reason why I wanted to ask, but (laughs) I appreciate you. Um, one more question regarding food is, is there any, like, ma and pa, like, restaurants, like, not, like, restaurant chains, like, a original ma and pa restaurant built from the ground? Oh, man. Ma and pa places around here. You know, I don't know a ton of ma and pa's around here. We have a few... Um, there's a place called Rock Bottom Brewery not too far from me that I believe is a, a Ma and Pa brewery still. Um, but I'm not, I'm not super familiar with a ton of them here. Um, I had lived, I, I, I'm living currently in San Jose, but I moved just a few months ago. I was living um, closer to the Stanford campus and up there, so I'm kind of back in San Jose now um, and learning some new spots down here a little bit as well. All right, cool. Interesting. All right. So, all right, yeah, it's it's tough to find a little Ma and Pa restaurant, especially with COVID having been a thing. But I hope that I hope for everyone's sake that there are still Ma and Pa restaurants and whatnot. So, anyway, let's jump to some Olympic talk. So, there have been Stanford women's volleyball players and a couple men's volleyball players playing in the Olympics. The on the women's side, there is. 
I'm going to probably butcher her name, so you might have to help me out with this. Faluke <laughs> Akinreduo Gunderson. Did I pronounce it right, or feel free no, to correct F- me? F- Faluke Akinradawa. <laughs> I well, wasn't Faluke, even close. Faluke is a le- she's a legend at, on, on the Stanford campus. Um, she is just like one of the most well-known volleyball players around, um, a huge impact on the team, and just just well-renowned and just loved across the board. And I think it's awesome that she's also playing in these Olympics. Um, you know, as she's, I believe she had a daughter in the last couple of years, so she's, you know, gone through that and then also come back now and is still playing at a super high level. I don't know. If, uh, I believe the team's playing tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they're currently um, playing right now. Sorry. Yeah, currently in a match, and so I... I would love to see her get another shot at, at a gold medal. I think that would be just incredible. Yeah, same here. And honestly, I, I they I saw their game against Argentina. They just stormed past them. It was just amazing right there. And like I said, they're currently playing right now. I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, other Stanford men's volleyball players that are playing are the Shoji brothers which is Eric Shoji and Kawika Shoji. Like, I actually just saw them in their most recent match against ROC. Like, what was that like uh, seeing them, if you have seen if you've seen them play any time? Yeah, I, I, so I, I really haven't seen them play in person, but I have seen them around um, during, like, the men's volleyball season. They've been at games before. Um, they are, you know, just extremely special people, you know, great athletes, better people. And I, I say that a lot about um, most of the Stanford athletes I've had the chance to interact with. They are incredible athletes, but beyond that, they're even better people. They really make you feel like you're welcome, like you're a part of something. And I can just tell when you watch them, they, uh, they have that same attitude, even with these teams. You'll notice that the brothers, that they're, 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 they're vocal leaders. Um, they have the ability to command the room when they walk in there. Then people respect what they have to say. Um, and I think that's really important because they can really galvanize the whole team and they can really bring everyone together. And they have that special ability to kind of make everyone feel like it's one big group. It's a family. It's not just, you know, six players on a court, but it's one team, you know. Um, and that's so important to have is to just be one unit out there. And it's hard in volleyball, you know. You, you have so many talented players on both sides. And something that, you know, we talk about a lot with volleyball is just being able to control your side of the net, you know. You really can only do that. I think that, that gets away from people at times. I think they have a really great, do a really great job of kind of settling everyone when things start going the way they don't want them to. Awesome. So one more player or one more coach I actually have to make note of that is on either volleyball roster is Matt Furbringer, who is the one of the assistant coaches for Team USA men's volleyball. Have you met him by chance? And and if so, what's he like? Yeah, so I, I have not met Matt in person. There were some members of, of the staff that I didn't have a chance to meet in the last year or so. Um, but I have heard really good things about Matt um, in the program so far. Um, and I do look forward to, as things start um, getting a little bit better and as next season rolls on, I think that we'll definitely have more uh, one-on-one time to get to know each other a bit better um, and talk more about the team a little bit as well. Yeah, he's currently the assistant coach for Long Beach State women's volleyball as he coaches with his wife, Joy McKenzie Furbringer, yep. as – I'm actually, yeah, so I'm actually a current, uh, well, former student at Long Beach State. I just recently graduated, so there, I, I knew the Furbringers really well. I'm like, oh, so that's Matt Furbringer, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> all right, so a couple more questions. So all in all with this whole play-by-play sports casting thing, what advice, what general advice do you have for, like, up-and-coming, like, sports casters and what are some like big things to avoid when starting out or just trying to make it to the big time? Uh, cursing on air is, is one of those. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that there, there, there are things that you can't do all, you know, the, the two biggest pieces of advice is one the mic is always hot. You have to remember that. Um, even if you don't think the mics are turned on, the mics are always turned on. 
Um, and that is really important because people have a tendency to say things sometimes before games, um, as it's been well documented through the years and on social media, you know, people having said things that have gotten caught on mics and people have lost their careers over it, you know. And, and in my view, if they're saying those things already, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of that kind of person, but um, it's something that, you know, if, if you're caught with a mic that's hot and you're saying the wrong thing, you can really get in a lot of trouble for it, you know. Um, and so it's something that, you know, if the mics are around and they're plugged in, you should always treat them as that they're live. Um, and that you can, you know, anything that's being said could be heard by the listeners as well. Um, that's a little bit dark, though, in terms of, like, things that could go wrong or, or, or could be bad. But, you know, just general advice and things that I would say to people starting out and people that are, you know, wanting to pursue it is, is kind of a little bit like what I mentioned earlier. But I just believe a lot in being yourself and being, you know, true to who you are and not trying to be another broadcaster. It's easy to watch you know, Paul Sunderland calling the national championship games and to, and, and to see, you know, um, Mike Green doing the NBA finals. And, and, and these are just legends in, in broadcasting. You know, these are people who have been doing it for so long. They have a, they, Their experience level is through the roof. They're so comfortable being on air. And then it's easy to look at your own highlight reel or your own tapes and go, wow, I really don't sound anything like that. And that's totally okay, and I think that's something that took me a while to get okay to become comfortable with, was hearing my own voice, being okay with my own voice, and then learning to really love my own voice. And and feeling like, you know, I'm, I want to go out there and I want to put on the best performance possible, you know. You know, something I always tell people who are getting into it is that you should always try and replicate the same energy and passion in the broadcast that the players are bringing to the court. Because they're going to go put their whole heart and soul into this game, you know, to just get a, to get a win sometimes. And the least that you can do as the broadcaster is to provide that same energy, enthusiasm, and effort that they're putting out on the court, you know. Um, so that's something I always tell people is to just be yourself, work hard, and just believe in yourself. You know, I think you have to believe that you're doing a good job. If you're not, I think people will say something to you or you would hope that constructive criticism would come. Um, and I think that when it does come, it, it, it's good to be as open ears as possible and to really take it, you know, in stride and not, not feel like people are trying to be negative to you, but really feeling like people are just trying to help you get further along, which I think some people can struggle with because they just view it as criticism towards their work. That is amazing advice and very well said and spoken. It really was um, amazing. So before we get out of here, I do have one more question to ask you, and this kind of does pertain to the pandemic. So when it came to this whole pandemic, there was this one item in particular that just whooshed off the shelf. It just disappeared without a trace, and not even the smartest people at Stanford can figure out whatever happened to this item and why it just suddenly flew off the shelves of stores. So I know we're not fully out of the pandemic, but we're through with the worst of it. But I need to know, Jimmy, when this whole pandemic started, did you have enough toilet paper? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no. Oh, no, no. I did not. Actually, we, we, we ran out. Um, about a week in, and my girlfriend uh, had to call one of her coworkers, who was basically like pimping out toilet paper to people. She was she was basically calling people up and and selling toilet paper, kind of like in front of her house, kind of thing, and just handing it out and passing it out. It was really funny because you know here we all are thinking toilet paper could never be something that's missing. And we were right there with everyone else just scavenging, just trying to find anything we could. And uh, we were we were able to get some through one of my girlfriend Brienne's coworkers. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we ran out just like a lot of people. It was impossible to find it. And hand sanitizer as well. Couldn't find that for a long time. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, were, you got, were able to get through it. But that is crazy. I still can't believe people were just hoarding the toilet paper. But... Other than that, thank you very much for being on the 100th episode of Set Point Jimmy. If you have a plug, definitely feel free to 
give your plug and like share what you share basically any special links or special websites you have to offer up. Yeah, you know, I think you mentioned earlier you can follow me at on Twitter at Jimmy JG twelve. That's my handle on there. And I, I usually, you know, I'm, I'm tweeting through live sporting events pretty often and getting my thoughts and, and on it all. And uh, I would love to hear from anyone that would like to contact me or would just like to, to chat about sports. Um, I met my DMs are always open, and I'm always willing to talk sports with anyone that always that would like to. So, you know, always feel free to chat if you'd like to at any point. Awesome stuff there, Jimmy. So st- uh, hold on for a little minute as we head to a commercial break. When we come back, I'm about to close the show of this 100th episode of Set Point. You are listening to Set Point here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. We'll be right back after this. What's going on, football fans? This is me, your boy Larry B, inviting you to join myself, Callum Reynolds, Mike Pat, and John Felipe for one of the most electrifying football shows you have ever heard. Three and out, right here at iX Sports Radio. Recap of the week before, a preview of what's to come, and of course, three hardcore head to head prom Tom face offs. Each week, you don't want to miss it. Are you a fan of volleyball? Are you a fan of Thunder Spikes? Then I have the show for you. Set Point, where I cover NCAA men's and women's volleyball, high school boys and girls volleyball, beach volleyball, and even professional volleyball. Catch the action every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Welcome back to the 100th episode of Set Point. Thank you once again to Jimmy Garcia of of Stanford Sports, who is a broadcaster and play-by-play announcer. He is on KZSU 90.1 FM for being a guest here on Set Point. I appreciate you being here, or I appreciate him being here. And that's pretty much going to conclude this show, and... Again, I really want to thank today's guests for stars. I want to thank Craig Pizzanti, who, believe it or not, he had to cr- we had to like cram this whole the twenty five minute segment very fast, and not everything was kind of going my way. I had to like make sure everything was set up and make sure there were no technical hitches. So, first and foremost, I got to thank Craig Pizzanti for being a guest on Set Point for a second time. He really came through in the clutch. I also want to thank Vinny Hardy and Terry Brown for being a guest here. Had that fun little segment at the middle of the show. And then lastly, I definitely want to thank Jimmy Garcia for being here. And then also I want to thank the listeners in the chat room, such as Ben Sutterith the third, who just recently popped in saying congrats on 100 episodes. I appreciate that, man. And then Gina G for listening for pretty much throughout the entire show, almost all three hours. And she was very interested in Jimmy as she is a big NorCal fan. And also I got to thank Larry B for being in the chat room and for helping me get set point off the ground. Also, I'll give a shout out to Pierre Moss, Adam Karnick, Marcus Los Great, Davidson Crooks for popping in. I definitely appreciate you all tuning in, popping in the chat room, because it really means a lot to me, because I want to continue to help set point 
improve and iSports Radio as a whole improve. And I hope that I can have a hundred more episodes. Like, I don't, why should I stop here? Because when I first saw Extra Mile reach its 100th episode, I thought to myself, I want to get to 100, 100 episodes. And then look at me now. So for a volleyball show, this is done pretty good. And also, I would have never thought in my wildest dreams uh, this show would be featured on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Podcast Addict, Deezer, Apple Podcasts. The, the list goes on and on. But all in all, it's just been a great time doing Set Point. I know I've had my ups and downs when it comes to Set Point, but I just got to keep plugging and keep believing in myself because obviously volleyball isn't the most talked about sport, but I can make that ha- – I could change that. So I really do appreciate everyone who – not only was a guest in the past, but everyone that's listened to the past, everyone that's offered me advice in the past, everyone that's just been a big, tremendous, big help to helping me improve set point. I really do appreciate it. And Gina says, you inspire me for real. And she says, elite show. I appreciate it, Gina. And you're going to get a hundred episodes, hit a hundred episodes with rep into NorCal sports pretty soon as well. But on that note, that's going to do it for the 100th episode of Set Point. I appreciate you all tuning in. I know we kind of went nearly three hours, but it's the 100th episode. Like, my 50th episode was pretty much this length. But without any further delay, it's time for me to say those famous four words, or famous three words, and... Long story short, on that little uh, on the on the outro or, or those three famous words that I always like to say. I again, I originally borrowed one of my co my colleagues like ending catchphrases, and then I had to think of something else. And then I thought of this next catchphrase, and it's like you know what? I'll stick with this. So without any further delay, for pretty much the probably the 80th time but on this 100th episode it is time to drop the beat because i'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate you feel me thank you very much to everyone that tuned in to set point i really do appreciate you especially if you've listened all through these two hours and 50 plus minutes if you're listening on the live stream i really appreciate you If you're listening via the playback, I appreciate you. If you're listening in the wee hours of the morning, I appreciate you. If you're listening while you're at work and trying not to get in trouble, I appreciate you. If you're listening at any time at all, I really, 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 really appreciate you. For everyone here at iSports Radio and for my guests, Craig Pizzanti, Jimmy Garcia, Vinny Hardy, and Terry TV Brown, this is Taryn Rodriguez signing off. You all have yourselves a great rest of the night, a great rest of the week. If you're going out to the beach, wear lots of sunscreen. If you're not vaccinated, please, please, please do get vaccinated. And I will see you Friday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. You all have yourself a great rest of the night. And it's high time that this outro takes us home. Peace!